Rock Island is a state park located on Lake Michigan at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin. It's a difficult place to get to. You have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across to Jackson Harbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry from there to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed there. Though the island is relatively small, about 975 acres, it has a rather interesting history. In the early 1600s, it was inhabited by a tribe of Native Americans, as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups didn't trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that nearly led to violence, but for the most part, they coexisted peacefully. By the 1640s, the Native Americans had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after their departure, some settlers reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They appeared to be more white settlers. However, they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to speak with one of these new settlers, or even find where they were living. It was around that time that strange things began to happen. Livestock. It's not mentioned which animals were found slaughtered in the village. Blood was found marking some of the buildings in the village. On a different night, a building used for meat preservation burned to the ground. The villagers felt that these actions must have been taken by these new people. They intended to find them. After a thorough search of the entire island, though, including the wooded inland area, not a single person was found. The strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search, and none of the settlers were ever seen again. In 1836, a lighthouse was built on the northern part of the island. After construction was finished, it was inspected, and the report read, The material of which the lighthouse and dwelling are made are of the best quality, and the work was done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of the construction of the lighthouse, Corbin began complaining of plaster falling from the building and that some sort of liquid would ooze through cracks, leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was totally alone most of the time in the lighthouse. Some said that when visiting him, he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was behaving strangely. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a new wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state after the years of isolation and thought it would be best that he spend some time away from the island. In 1852, Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December in the lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the structure. The next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends, having visited the new keeper at his dwelling, said that he would talk of seeing things in the house at night, but would not elaborate on what it was that he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or family member stay with them. No odd events were further reported in the lighthouse logbook outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks, with the exception of January 20th, 1876. The keeper at the time, named Betts, reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. 
He wrote that a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure and that they had never made it to their destination. Over three months later, on May 3rd, 1876, Betts wrote, The two men who were lost last January have been seen several times. Once from Caney Lighthouse and once from Jacksonport. The men were apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account, they were still adrift. There is not much hope that they will be found and buried. By 1900, most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas. In 1910, a successful business owner and investor named Chester Thorderson purchased all of the island, with the exception of the land occupied by the lighthouse. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. Thorderson is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that remain on the island today. On the south end of the island, he built a giant stone hall containing a boathouse on the lower level. A stone water tower was constructed on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was erected to the west. The Great Hall was used as a library to store Thorderson's immense book collection. He owned over 11,000 books, and it's rumored that his collection included some very rare volumes on the occult. Thorderson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, and some have speculated that he actually saw something which scared him to death. The history I've provided here has been to give context for the experiences that I myself have had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021, I took my first and last trip there. After taking the two ferry rides, I arrived at around 2 p.m. I had booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that's a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time enjoying the scenery on the hike to the camp's location, taking a couple of breaks also due to the weight of my pack. I was definitely packed more than necessary for camping. I got to the site and set up my tent, got everything situated. I then began gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach to start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my site, I heard a single high-pitched squealing sound coming from the forest. It wasn't close, but it was so unusual that I stopped in my tracks, waiting and listening to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued my trek back. When I returned, I started working on getting the fire going. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D, and E are grouped together, but there's probably a hundred yards between each one. There's no real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between them to have made an obvious path. As I was setting up sticks in my fire ring, something caught my eye, and I looked up. A fair distance away, it could have been at Site D or a bit further, there was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well, that's odd, because like I said, it wasn't even really a trail that they were on. Then my mind went to, there must be something wrong, that this person must need my help. They got a little closer, and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose gray clothes, maybe wearing a hoodie. It was still too far away for me to be able to make out any real details. I quickly rose from the crouching position that I was in, and just as I did, I heard that high-pitched noise again. It was behind me, and it was much closer this time. This startled me quite a bit, so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple seconds, but didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around, thinking that the running person must be getting close, but now they were gone. Again I stood there and scanned the trees. They were nowhere to be seen. I was so confused that I stood frozen there for a few moments. 
It was all very weird. But I was able to reason it out in my head that it must have been a fellow camper from Site C or D who had been running for the pit toilet located a couple hundred yards west of the sites. I tried to forget about it, but it was really bothering me. I did not like whatever that noise was, and I just felt really off about the entire thing. After some effort, I let it go and got my campfire going. I ate a quick meal and drank a few beers, then decided to go for a little walk. I hadn't been to Site C or D yet, so I thought that I would check them out, see if I did have some neighbors camping close by. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from the site to the main trail and pit toilet, so that made me feel a little less uneasy. I figured it was maybe someone from Site C who took a wrong turn and wound up taking the long way around by going through Site D to get to the main trail. It didn't make a ton of sense, because I probably still should have seen them, but it still made me feel a little bit better. I continued on to Site C and saw that there was a tent set up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I thought I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as their camping neighbor and see if anyone looked like they might have been the runner from before. I came up to the site and saw a couple sitting at a picnic table. Neither of them appeared to be the person that I had seen. We went through our social formalities, introducing ourselves to each other. They were probably in their mid-thirties, both very nice and both very drunk, but quiet drunk. I didn't ask about the runner or the noises. I thought it might be weird. I wished them a good night and walked back to my tent. When I got there, I smoked a cigar and had a few more drinks. It was getting dark. It started out as a perfect night. The sky was clear, and I just hung out looking up at the millions of stars hovering above. I felt calmer about everything and decided to get some sleep. It had been a long day, so I passed out almost instantly. At nearly 2.30 a.m., I was awoken by a huge boom of thunder. The sky had begun pouring rain. The wind picked up, and the temperature dropped. I love camping in the rain, but I do not love camping in a lightning storm. I was beginning to worry. The wind was whipping around my tent, and the ground shook from the thunder and lightning. I didn't feel great about being out there in a tent, so exposed. The storm only lasted for another hour, though, before it turned into a light, steady drizzle, and I was beginning to doze off. Just as I was nearly asleep, though, I heard the squealing noise yet again. I opened my eyes wide and lay there silent in the dark. Then came another noise, this time much closer. I knew there were no really dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer, porcupine, but nothing like bear or wolves. Still, Knowing that didn't do anything to reassure me. There was just something about that sound that made me incredibly uneasy, even paranoid. I keep calling it a squeal as well because that's the best description that I have for it. It sounded to me like a pig squeal. I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, but that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured, angry pig squeal. I continued to lay in my tent and started hearing footsteps outside. It was still raining, so the sounds were a little buried in the sound of the rain, but it definitely sounded like a large animal or another human that was walking around. I sat up and took out my knife. In my head, I kept telling myself that it was fine, that there was nothing in those woods that could hurt me. I listened as the footsteps started moving away. Then I just sat there, still holding my knife, for about ten minutes without hearing anything. I kept internally telling myself that it was just an animal, everything was fine, and that I was being stupid because I just needed to get more sleep. Just as I was about to lay back down, however, there was yet another squeal. This one was very loud and very close. 
as in right outside my tent. It felt as though my heart just stopped then and there, and a shiver went down my spine. My heart beat so hard that I felt my pulse through my entire body and could hear the blood rushing in my ears. It took everything in me to force the words, get out of here, from my mouth. I didn't shout, but tried to be as stern and mean-sounding as I could in the moment. I didn't hear any more footsteps or squeals that night, but I also couldn't sleep. I just laid there in the tent until eventually the rain stopped and the sun rose into the sky. All the time I kept reassuring myself and at the same time telling myself that I had to be being stupid. It had to be just an animal. It was probably 7 a.m. before I decided that I had to get up to relieve myself. As soon as I unzipped the tent flaps and stepped out, I saw that the site's picnic table had been flipped upside down. When I saw this, I was surprisingly calm in my reaction. I simply thought, okay, this is enough, I'm leaving the island today. I checked my surroundings. Nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned that the wind had blown the table over during the previous night's storm. It still seemed weird, though, because the table was heavy, and I felt like I would have heard it being turned over. I made some cold instant coffee, had a bite to eat. I started feeling better again, so I decided to go for a hike. I must admit, I get pretty easily scared when I'm camping in the woods by myself. Maybe that's natural. After breakfast and getting a bit of sun, I realized that nothing I heard was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time. The reason I came to the island in the first place was to hike the Seven Mile Thordersons Loop Trail. It has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to get going. I packed a few things in my backpack and started off. Fairly close to my site was the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a tower. But it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked as though it had been used recently. A bit further down the trail was a cemetery. It's known that two sisters and a few others are buried there, but it's also believed that there are more unmarked graves. They were likely some of the settlers from the old fishing village. The island has three cemeteries. One is by the beach, and that's where Chester Thorderson is buried. One is on the eastern part of the island, where the two sisters are buried. And one is on the northern part of the island, where the original lighthouse keeper David E. Corbin is buried. There's also at least one Native American burial ground on the island. However, no one knows exactly where it is. I kept walking until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench, where I sat down and drank some water. That's when I heard someone talking on the trail ahead of me though I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail, and the trees were thick. I sat on the bench waiting for the people to appear. The voices were coming closer, and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what language that it might have been. Both voices were very deep, guttural. Then, from deep in the woods, I heard a loud call. Immediately, both of the voices I was listening to responded with a call of their own. I kind of smiled because it sounded like they were mocking whatever had made the sound in the forest. I got off the bench, put my backpack back on, and started walking further down the trail from them. I never actually saw the people, though. The rest of the hike went well. I visited the grave of Davy D. Corbin. I took a self-guided tour of the lighthouse. I passed by a wooden gate that seemed to have been used as part of a larger structure. Next, I went past the Great Hall and Dock area from where I had arrived on the island and visited some of the other structures. Next, I came across the cemetery housing the body of Thorderson himself. And finally, I finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a very nice hike, with a lot to see, and it wasn't especially difficult, but still, I was tired. 
I did go down to Camp C and ask the couple from the night before about how they had fared during the storm, but they had already packed up and left. I was disappointed because I'd also considered asking them whether they had heard the squealing noises. The rest of the evening was uneventful. I built a fire, made a meal, had a cigar and some drinks. As soon as it got dark, I was ready for bed, especially after having had so little sleep the night before. I got inside my tent and quickly faded out of consciousness. I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly, instantly alert. Nothing that I was aware of had caused me to wake up, but I felt that something was wrong. I sat up, and this part of what happened is difficult to explain. A feeling of complete dread washed over me. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced. It was as if something or someone was inside that tent with me and I could feel its anger, its seething rage, its hatred of me. Something very bad was about to happen and I couldn't do anything about it. I started to shiver uncontrollably. There was a smell in the air, that of garbage or rotten meat. It was so strong that I wanted to throw up. I couldn't even move though, I was frozen, and even weirder is that I accepted whatever was about to happen to me. Like my brain was telling me that whatever was about to occur, even if it were death, that it would at least be relief. Then I passed out. At least, I have to assume that I passed out. That's all I remember anyway, until waking up around eight the next morning. I opened my eyes to discover that I was laying outside my sleeping bag on top of it, and my legs were in an unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back, with my left leg straight out, and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart was pounding, but I kept telling myself that it was a dream and that I was leaving right then. I packed up very quickly and started off toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island. Since it wouldn't be arriving until 10.30, I had a little time to kill around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get away from that place badly, but I did feel a smidge better just being out of the woods where I could see other people. I sat down on a bench, a little to the east of the dock, and lit a cigar, just giving myself something to do while trying not to think of the night before. I was sitting a few minutes, scanning out over the water, when I was startled by someone saying, Hi! I jumped and was embarrassed when the person came around apologizing, saying that they were just wanting to ask whether I had a lighter. I felt like an idiot, and told him that it was fine, that I just hadn't had much sleep. I tossed him my lighter and he lit a cigarette, then gave it back, and we began chit-chatting about the usual things that you would discuss with strangers where we were both from, the weather, and so on. It was a nice, normal conversation, and he seemed like a pretty nice guy. Naturally, in the course of our talking, he asked about which campsite that I had stayed at. I told him, and in response, he explained that whenever he books the site, he comes to the island and chooses whichever spot that he wants, because the site requires the stay to be booked, but that you can actually camp wherever you want to because it isn't monitored. He told me that he comes to the island a few times a year, and that once he found a small log house in the woods. That his plan was to attempt and find that location again, and camp inside the cabin. After my personal experience with only one time camping on the island under my belt, I kind of wanted to change the subject, to be honest. Then he asked if I had heard the screeching sounds. I knew that he was talking about the squealing, I told him that I had, and asked if he knew what it was. It took a second for him to reply, and when he did, I saw his face change. He had this expression on his face as if he were debating whether or not he should tell me, as if it were some kind of secret. Then, in a calm and matter-of-fact manner, he told me, 
a demon lives on this island. Under any other circumstance, I would have laughed him all the way back to the mainland. Not after what I had heard and felt, though. He looked at me and must have sensed my anxiety and fear, because he gave a quick laugh, asking me if I had seen anything at night. I told him that I hadn't, and he stared at me like he was trying to solve a puzzle. I felt like he could tell that I was lying, that I had, in fact, experienced something. At this point, I was officially ready for the conversation to be over. Then he told me that he had seen something in the cemetery in the dark. His face and mood changed again, like he was now trying to confide in me. I didn't want to ask what had happened, but I knew that he wanted me to, so I did, and when I spoke, my voice came out shaky. I could tell he changed his mind then about sharing with me. He actually looked at me with empathy instead, and told me that it was hard for him to explain. That if I was afraid of the screeching noises, though, that I probably shouldn't go near the cemeteries. I didn't respond right away, and then he said these four words completely without context or explanation. Keepers of the flame. I looked down at my cigar, ashed it and put it out, and told him that I was going to wait by the dock for the ferry. He nodded, and I started walking away. After a few steps, he called out to me, and I turned to look at him. Don't come back here, he said. I turned back, continuing to walk away from him. I don't know if his words were a friendly suggestion or a warning, but I took them to heart. I am definitely not going back to Rock Island. When I got home, I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things the mysterious stranger could have been referring to. The name of the Native American tribe who once lived on the island could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were also referred to as Keepers of the Flame. And then, there was a 19th century cult said to visit the island from time to time who called themselves the Keepers of the Flame. I know hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year and have a great time camping, hiking the trails, and exploring the buildings. I can only say that in my humble opinion, if you've never paid the island a visit, stay away. My family and I lived at a large property called Gladstone Villa in the former mining town of Bargoed in the Carefilly County borough of the South Wales Valleys in the UK. From 1969 to 1978, we experienced activity that simply defied rational explanation, such as lights going off and on. We witnessed electrical cables being pulled, and my grandfather Bill claimed to have had a glass bottle thrown towards him as he entered the main bedroom, missing him by inches. I didn't personally see this myself, but I still recall the time he came from there with the broken bottle in his hands, and he told us what happened. There was the occasional sighting, but this was very rare indeed, so rare that in all the nine years I was there, I never once saw it, but I did hear it many times in the bedroom. It's still worth mentioning that my mother, Caroline, saw it on at least two occasions. There were also regular footsteps heard in the main bedroom every evening. Sometimes during the day, we'd all be downstairs watching TV. One of us would turn the volume down to hear it more clearly, and my grandfather Bill would point to the ceiling and say, He's by there, or He's by there now, trying to make out where the footsteps were coming from exactly. There were five members of the family that were living at the Gladstone Villa. My maternal grandfather was William Higgs, known as Bill to family and friends, a retired miner who worked at the local colliery. 
He was a short, bald man who liked nothing more than to listen to his country and western LPs, Johnny Cash, Glen Campbell, and so on. He also liked westerns on TV that starred John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. My maternal grandmother was Rita Higgs. She was a short woman who was a housewife. She was completely teetotal, but liked to smoke. She also liked collecting garden gnomes and liked watching soap operas on TV. My mother, Caroline Dexter, met my father at the local bakehouse on Baldwin Street. She was day shift regularly and my father worked the night shift. He would stay behind to make her a cup of tea and chat. They dated for three years before they got married on Monday the 1st of April 1968. The Beatles were number one with Lady Madonna. They did not get a place of their own, but they decided to live with my grandparents at Gladstone Villa, which was in Cardiff Road. I was born on August 24th, 1969, when everyone was listening to the latest number one in the charts, Honky Tonk Woman by the Rolling Stones. It was soon after that that my mother said that strange things started to happen. I was just a baby when she said it all started off rather quietly, like small tapping here and there, but nothing too noticeable. But in time, the activity gradually increased. One time, my mother said the family heard a noise. A noise like someone jumping down from the attic and onto the landing. Naturally thinking that someone was trying to break in, they went to see what was going on. When they got there, they found no one, but the latch to the attic was open. Whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the main bedroom, which incidentally was my grandparents' room. It soon made its presence felt by walking around the bedroom and the sounds of dragging could be heard. One day, my mother went upstairs to that bedroom to get my father up for work so he could be ready for his night shift. When she got there, she was confronted by the sight of the ironing board placed on my father's torso as he slept. When he awoke, he was astonished to find the situation he was in. He suspected my grandfather Bill was playing pranks, but in time he knew my grandfather was not responsible for it, and he told his work friends what was going on, and it got around town that Gladstone Villa was haunted. My parents separated in 1972 and my father left Gladstone Villa. But it wasn't because of what was going on at the villa. It was just a breakdown of the marriage. They finally divorced on the 25th of April, 1975. The British band, the Bay City Rollers, were number one in the charts with Bye Bye Bay. Again, very apt. It would have been amusing but for the fact of what was going on there. I was barely two years old, so I have no memory of my father living at the villa. But he would come to see me every Saturday to take me to see my paternal grandparents and to the local cinema. Great times, even though the paranormal activity still continued. As I got older, too, I witnessed the activity for myself. I actually saw the poltergeist activity. I watched electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces. I saw the lights going on and off. And when my grandfather Bill would play records on Sunday as the family did dinner, it would turn the music off. It took exception to the British band Slade and any religious TV shows my grandmother Rita would watch. The local police were also involved. I remember them popping their heads into the attic, hesitating and not going in. But they suggested it was my father playing a prank on the family. A family friend, Mrs. Ivy France, she was more of a friend to my grandmother Rita, she was very skeptical when my grandmother told her that Gladstone Villa was haunted. I can remember Ivy going into the main bedroom, looking around and saying it was vibration from the traffic outside causing it, but she was soon to change her mind when she experienced it for herself. It was then she suggested that the local press be contacted and a medium. The medium was John Matthews, and when he came to Gladstone Villa, he started by asking the family questions. He then began by challenging the spirit to perform by knocking on the ceiling, and sure enough, it responded by knocking back at him. 
At some point, John went into a trance to try to make contact with it, but he failed to get a name. He later confirmed the obvious, that there was indeed a presence there, and that it was an earthbound spirit, and that it had unfinished business. A priest by the name of Graham Jones was then called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property, and after a few prayers, he duly left, and it was quiet for a few short months after that. No incidents. But it did return, and with a vengeance, and this time it decided to show itself. One evening, my grandfather Bill, my mother Caroline, and I were watching television. My grandmother Rita was reading a book, when all of a sudden my mother just so happened to look to her left and she saw a full, solid figure of a monk standing by the doorway. We did not see this as we were otherwise occupied, but she later described it in detail as a monk in typical brown habit, complete with hood over the head so she didn't see the face. It sounded very much like a 16th century Benedictine monk. Fred Davies was a friend of my grandfather Bill. They worked together at the local colliery, and he would visit most evenings. Fred was a slim man who would wear a flat cap and glasses and smoked homemade cigarettes that hung from his lips as he spoke. He would sit in his favorite chair by the open fire and talk to the family and watch TV with us. One day, Fred was with us, in his casual place by the open fire. I was quietly playing with my toys by the sideboard. It was tranquil, when all of a sudden there was one very loud bang. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head and I ran to my mother for comfort. When it was gone, we all went upstairs. My grandfather, Bill, would always be the first and I would be the last. When we went to that bedroom, we found nothing that could account for that noise. Fred later told us that he ducked his head as he thought it was going to come through the ceiling. Fred told us of another experience he had at Gladstone Villa. My grandfather Bill liked to look out the landing window that overlooked Cardiff Road and into the Bargoed Town Center. This time Fred joined him, and he said that he felt something brush past him. But when he looked, there was nothing there. The most frightening experience I had was when I was alone in that particular bedroom. I made sure the light was on. It was very quiet as usual. I was lying on the bed facing the window that overlooked Cardiff Road when I suddenly felt something heavy pounce on the bottom of the bed. I heard the bed springs go just once, and I felt the bed bounce. I didn't look straight away, but when I did, there was nothing there. I went downstairs to tell my family and we all went back up. We saw distinctive paw marks on the bed, like that of an animal. I later found out that my grandfather had a black Labrador dog called Tovey, who died before I was born. My grandfather Bill and my mother Caroline claimed to have heard a baby crying there. But, as I didn't hear it at the time, I took very little notice of what they said. The activity got so bad that my mother, grandmother, and I slept downstairs with the lights on. It was only my grandfather Bill who was supposedly brave enough to sleep in the bedroom itself. It was then that he himself had yet another experience. He told us that he was lying on the bed when all of a sudden he couldn't move. He couldn't even shout for us to help him. This could well have been sleep paralysis, but he said that he heard something in the room with him. My grandmother Rita had her own experiences. One day she went upstairs into that room to get my grandfather up when she saw the boiler door open wide by itself. She didn't stay there to see what it was, but she rushed out. Another occasion, she said that she had the sense of something pulling from under her foot, as if she had stepped on someone's gown. We had the ghost for so long that my grandmother Rita gave it a pet name. She called him Johnny, and my grandfather Bill would shout out that name to provoke a reaction, but nothing would happen. Ivy Francis' son, Charles, got to hear about what was going on at the Gladstone Villa, and he came along with some friends and with my family's permission, they went into the bedroom. 
It frightened one of his friends, and to this day, his friend still says that it is a spooky place. My mother Caroline had an operation on her and ended up on crutches. The local nurse would tend to her foot. One day, she was sitting on a chair when the nurse came, and the nurse knelt down to tend to her, and she told my mother not to hold her. My mother looked at my grandmother Rita in amazement, as she was not holding the nurse at all. My mother made her own conclusions that it was Johnny the ghost that was holding her, so as not for the nurse to hurt her. The only time I heard the ghost being vocal was the time that we were all in the room. One of us wanted to use the bathroom and we couldn't get in there. My grandfather Bill said, he's behind there. I heard quite distinctively the sound of a Gregorian chant, and that was it. Nothing more. We left in the summer of 1978, when two local businessmen bought the property in Gladstone Villa, was eventually converted into a small hotel and its name changed to Red's Park Hotel. On the night before we moved, there was one final incident that we experienced, as if it knew that we were going and that was its way of saying goodbye. My mother, grandmother, and I got ready to go to sleep. The light was still on and then we heard the doorknob turning as if someone were trying to get in. At first, I naturally suspected my grandfather Bill as he was the only one who slept upstairs in that room, and we thought it may have been him playing a prank. I called out to him, but there was no answer, no laugh that would give him away. We then heard our belongings that were packed in the hallway being thrown around. The next day, we asked my grandfather Bill if it was him playing a joke on us. He insisted that it wasn't him, and to this very day, I believe him. I had my 40th birthday at Red's Park Hotel in August of 2009 for old time's sake, and it was the female staff that told me about the ghost and I told them what had happened to me there 30 years before. The staff told me of their own personal experiences, lights going off and on, the odd sighting in a room, a bridge, a bride in white was seen. Again, as with the claims of the baby crying that made no sense to me at the time. I did a thorough research of the property in the Cardiff Road area and I found out some very interesting things indeed. I found out from the Bargood Library and the local newspaper archives that Gladstone Villa dates back to 1900, and it was named after the former British Prime Minister William Gladstone. I discovered the previous people that lived there, the Kimyet family in 1924, the new married couple Michael and Evelyn Kimyet, and a son named Elvin. He died at the property at just four months old, according to the archives of Cardiff newspaper The Western Mail of that year. This explained the baby my mother and grandfather had heard in that bedroom so long ago. Mrs. Evelyn Kimyet died in 1970, soon after I was born. Maybe this is why all the activity started. I also found that there was a monastery in Baldwin Street where my parents met and worked, and there's a property directly opposite the former Gladstone Villa property in Cardiff Road dating back to the 16th century. It is now a public house called the Rafa Club. A priest hide is said to be there, but it's sealed up. This explains the monk that my mother saw. What I have said here is true. I wouldn't share this if I couldn't possibly back this up, and I have used real names, as I have nothing to hide, and all I have said can be verified by the family of those people that I mentioned. Sadly, some of the people I've mentioned are no longer with us. I challenge any hardened skeptic and firm non-believer, and I can assure them that they will indeed most certainly question their belief system. Of this, I have no doubt at all whatsoever. In fact, I am 100% positive.
This story takes place in 2017. My then best friend, I'll call her Lex, and I were having a sleepover at my dad's house. I was 16 at the time, her being 17. We often had sleepovers on Fridays where we would eat junk food, watch as much Netflix as possible, and have deep conversations. This night was no different and so unremarkable that I've forgotten everything that we did. That is, of course, until we were trying to fall asleep in my bed. I remember being completely exhausted, slowly but surely drifting off despite sharing a bed with someone. I was just on the brink of sleep when Lex got my attention. First, she simply asked if I was awake. I grunted in response, signaling for her to continue. It should be said that I was quite literally a minute or two away from unconsciousness, so I didn't pick up on her tone of voice or think much about what she said next. I'm gonna go use the bathroom downstairs, she told me, getting off the bed. This wasn't normal, her announcing that she would be slipping away to use the restroom, but I was too out of it to be annoyed or curious. Not long after she left, probably no more than ten seconds, it started happening. Again, I was on the precipice of sleep, so my mind wasn't racing with thoughts or in any state to freak myself out. Nevertheless, I became filled with the feeling of impending danger out of absolutely nowhere. I was becoming very lucid very quickly as dread and anxiety overwhelmed me. I had never felt this kind of acute fear before nor seemingly out of nowhere. Now wide awake, I opened my eyes and stared at the wall. I opened my eyes and stared at the wall less than a foot away from my face as I slept facing away from the bedroom door. My heart raced as I tried to understand the situation, but I didn't move. Something told me that moving would be a very bad idea. My room was pitch black as well, so that didn't help matters. All I could think about was how scared I was, and how I hoped that Lex would return soon. I can guess that a few minutes passed like this, when suddenly the bed dipped on the side that I wasn't occupying, as if someone were sitting down. Problem was, not only did Lex struggle to get onto my bed due to its height, but my bedroom door had never opened. At this point, I was petrified, and I only became more afraid as I felt something against the back of my body. It felt like a person, just gently pressed against me. I thought to myself hysterically that there was no way this was actually happening. I held my breath to better isolate the feeling, horrified to feel the presence moving as if it were breathing, too. In and out, pressed against me in and out. The atmosphere is still suffocating in the room, filled with what I can only describe as evilness. The aura of whatever was touching me screamed danger. Don't move. I will hurt you. My mind and heart are racing as I try to think of a way out of this. The only balm I have to lessen my anxiety is the fact that I know Lex will eventually return. But what happens then? She wouldn't see whatever it was pressed against me when she entered the bedroom, too occupied with making sure she wasn't disturbing my sleep. So I told myself that once I heard the door open, I would address her and ask her to turn on the lights. After what I would come to find out was about half an hour, Lex finally did return. The second I heard the door open and light flooded into the bedroom, I called her name. She hesitated, her soft voice saying, Yeah? I requested bluntly, Turn on the lights. She did as I asked, and I shot like a bullet from my previous position, whipping around to inspect the area where I had felt the presence. There was nothing. I wouldn't notice right away. But later I realized that the horrifying aura that was plaguing my bedroom had vanished once Lex arrived. It was gone just as suddenly as it had appeared. Still, 
I was in a state of horror for the next few hours. We watched some cartoons together and decided to sleep with the lights on, but not before talking about what had just happened. Lex revealed to me that the reason she had gone downstairs wasn't to use the restroom, but to call her boyfriend for emotional support. She told me that she had felt panicked, wanting to leave the room to escape from the stifling feeling. Lex couldn't get a hold of him, and spent the next 30 minutes or so trying to calm herself down. In the morning, Lex and I would confide in my dad, the only other person in the house. He was rightly disturbed and told us that he had a nightmare that night. I can't remember what his nightmare consisted of, only that it was a really bad one. My dad is a veteran, so he is not easily spooked, but it left him uneasy. The fact that my dad had a nightmare at all made this whole experience more notable to me. To wrap things up, I want to say that I had improperly used a spirit board a few years before this with a few of my friends at my dad's house. We were children, so we didn't take it any more seriously than any other Halloween game. Nothing of this magnitude had ever occurred before, though. Just this one night. Lex and I were able to acquire holy water from one of the teachers at our high school after she told him the story. We used it to cleanse my bedroom. Nothing strange has happened to me, or my dad, since. I've gathered a few paranormal encrypted stories after moving to North Carolina. The silver UFO, the shadow person, the six lights, etc. But this one stuck out to me the most. I have never even heard of this thing or even knew that this thing existed, and I was a kid when I saw it. It could be my mind exaggerating, but another person with me saw it, and it freaked us both out. We were driving along the back roads of North Carolina and learning the shortcuts and ways to get around as we had just moved here. It was the evening, and it was around false summertime, the time where it's hot randomly in the spring, so the windows were rolled down. We were just having fun cruising and sightseeing. The other person with me was driving and was chit-chatting to me about the smells and plants that I should stay away from. We were passing a cow farm, so we rolled up our windows, and the curve past the farm was coming up, so we rolled them back down. Now after you hit this curve, there's a hill and it flattens out into a straight but crummy road. In the middle of the road, something blackish was walking. It was shaggy, and was just walking all calm as if it was sightseeing too. I remember my friend asking, what's this dog doing? It looked as big as a black bear or a derpy St. Bernard, and it walked with a normal stride. We slowly crept up on it, hoping that it would hear the car and move out of the way, but it didn't. So my friend gave the horn a little tap, and this thing finally turned around. Its eyes were reflected from the headlights. It hunched down and hissed. When it turned, its tail lifted, and it was long and black. It then darted off into the woods. My friend was puzzled. I just sat there in disbelief at what I had just witnessed. It was an odd and quiet ride back home. Fast forward to more than a decade later, me and a few friends were looking at local urban legends because one of them swore up and down that they saw the ghost that everyone was talking about and wanted to know more about it. I'm zoning out because I'm an introvert and went looking around in the website that we found. I see this title called The Vampire Beast of North Carolina and was like, what the hell? North Carolina's got a hillbilly vampire? I click on it and read. Some beast was terrorizing locals and their farm animals, leaving puncture wounds, no blood, and leaving the body there. Multiple bodies of dead animals in one night, all dead the same way. I scoffed and say, El Chupacabra, like Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory, and kept scrolling. 
I read some more and saw, here's what witnesses recount seeing. And when I scrolled down to see a hand-drawn picture of it, I nearly shat bricks. The photo the eyewitnesses had drawn of what they saw looked exactly like what I had seen over a decade ago. The shape, the tail, the color. I went pale and exited out of the page and just sat there, thinking on my life's existence up to this point, wondering if I had some sort of brain damage, because I was like, there's no way that this can be real, what I saw. But what really hit the nail on the coffin was that this thing was attacking people's farm animals. And I had seen this thing by a cow farm. I haven't seen this beast again. I really don't want to because I think it's a bad omen since I have a superstitious family, which is why I think paranormal and odd occurrences happen to us. Whenever we do have odd experiences, we don't speak about it to each other. People often wonder what would happen if they used a Ouija board. Some people do it for fun. Some people use it for spiritual communications. I can tell you now that if you have no experience in using a Ouija board, do not do it. This is a story about what happens when you use one for fun without knowing the consequences. When I was about 12, it was Halloween night, go figure, and we had just had a Halloween party for family and friends. A few of my older sister's friends stayed the night that night, and we were just hanging out in our room, which we shared. One of her friends had a spirit tethered to her. That's what she claimed. Whether or not it was true, I still don't know to this day, and she said, let's go for it. I wanted nothing to do with it, but being 12 years old and curious, I had to observe. They didn't follow any of the rules that you're supposed to as far as not putting it on a blanket, not lighting the proper candles, and other things that you're supposed to do prior to using the Ouija board. They were just calling on spirits that they could think of and trying to communicate with them. That's where things got a little creepy. If I remember correctly, one of the spirits that came to the board was a woman, and she was not friendly. She began to spell out profanities, and they quickly shut that down. I can't remember what the second spirit was, but it was also not friendly and called itself Satan. All of a sudden, one of my sister's friends began to panic. She said she saw a man out on the street with a red and black face. We did not see the man out on the street, so I don't know if she was having a panic attack and seeing things or what. The next event that occurred was kind of insane and terrifying. All of a sudden, my sister started zoning out and staring at nothing. We tried to get her attention, and she gave no response. Then she got up and walked downstairs, and we were confused, so we just followed her. We heard something in the kitchen, so we went and checked that out. My sister was standing over the sink, taking knives from the counter in the knife holder, and she was throwing them into the sink, one after the other. We try to get her attention again, and again, she refuses to respond to us. Then she goes and grabs the coffee pot off of the coffee maker and drinks black coffee straight out of it. Mind you, she hated coffee at the time. She drank the entire thing. She got up and went to sit on the couch, and a couple of minutes later, she blinked and came to. She asked us why we were staring at her, and how did she get downstairs. To this day, she has no memory of what happened, and it is 21 years later. We're pretty sure that a spirit took over her body just to have some fun. My grandma, after my mom told her what had happened, came into the house and blessed it with holy water. It seemed to help for a while, and then I had the series of nightmares a year or so later, so I'm wondering if the holy water didn't really have much effect. So this is a lesson learned and a disclaimer to anyone who wants to mess with a Ouija board. If you have no real experience with it, do not go there. You never know what you're going to be inviting into your home.
On May 9th of this year, I went to a flea market to browse. I passed by a clear cabinet that held an assortment of old antique dolls, and I was particularly drawn to an old, cracked doll wearing a hat with feathers. As I examined her closer, I noticed that she had a cloth body, but her arms, head, and legs were made of the same type of plastic, or possibly porcelain. I felt very drawn to her and was surprised by her price, only $35. She wasn't in very good condition and was clearly ancient based on the cracks on her body and the way that her face is painted on. I returned to the cashier with the doll and immediately the workers who had been deep, the workers who had been deep in conversation halted and fell quiet. They proceeded to tell me a little more about the doll, who supposedly hexes anyone who inconveniences her. This only made me feel more inclined to purchase her, as someone who is very interested in the paranormal, and as it is part of my faith, Wicca. So I ended up buying her. My younger sister, Eleven, wasn't very happy that I had bought the doll, whose name was Madame Leonora. She felt very thrown off by the doll's presence and requested that the doll be placed in the trunk on the ride home. I didn't want to upset the doll in case I got hexed, but my parents insisted that I put the doll in the trunk. So I did. That same day, I almost went to the hospital after an accident at my home. Similar disturbing events happened around the home whenever someone insulted Madame or did something she didn't like. These events pose a possible trauma trigger for some people, so I won't specify what the events were here. Just know that they were serious, and they were awful. I began giving Madame gifts and saying good morning and good night to her every day. On the first day that I gave her a gift, a package that I hadn't been expecting for another two weeks came in the mail. Every time I give her a gift, she gives me good luck. Madame and I had formed a friendship, but towards late June I began having strange, very specific dreams. In these dreams, Madame would climb down off of the shelf where she lives and escort me outside. We'd light candles and perform a ritual, and then I would bury Madame in a box with the gifts that I had given her over the months. As soon as the dream ends, I wake up. So, with the knowledge that I have because of my Wiccan faith, I decided to hold a seance of sorts in order to communicate with the spirit hosting my doll. I lit a candle and used a pendulum with a board to communicate. The candle flame responded to everything I said, and I have never seen such clear responses through my pendulum before. Based on what I got out of the session, Madame was able to tell me that she would like to be buried, but won't reveal to me why. I've never sensed any negative energy around Madame before, but with each passing day, the air in my room feels heavier, if that makes any sense. I'd like to fulfill her wish and bury her, because I think she may be a Victorian mourning doll, but the vendors who sold her have no information on her at all only that she makes bad things happen. If she is indeed a Victorian mourning doll, it would make sense why she wants to be buried. The only problem is that she refuses to tell me why I have to bury her. If anyone can tell me if there's any danger to burying her, if there's anything I should know about this, or what I can do to identify what time period she's from, I'd really appreciate the help. This happened around the end of November of last year, while I was at a late night party at a mutual friend's house. The night started off fine with us having a few drinks and talking about the classes that we would be taking next semester. This pretty much went on till around 2 a.m. and by this time I wanted to go home since the party was already dying down and most of my friends had already left and I was practically there alone. 
Instead of wasting money on an Uber, I decided to walk home since my neighborhood was only a few blocks away, but it was still a decent walk. However, there was a shortcut. There was a secluded dirt road in the neighborhood which led to a stretch of walkway with an irrigation canal for crops, and it happened to lead straight to the backyard of my house. I began making my way to the lonely dirt road, and I started to second-guess my decisions since that stretch of walkway can be pretty shady, especially at night since a few drug dealers and junkies like to hang out there. I mustered up the little courage I had, feeling confident that I'd be able to handle myself if anything ever hit the fan, so I proceeded to walk on the desolate road. The night sky was well lit. The moon illuminated my surroundings enough for me to see my environment pretty clearly. The walk was actually pleasant. The only thing that made it tough to navigate was the overgrown thorny weeds and mesquite branches that kept scraping against the exposed parts of my skin. As I continued to walk through the brush, I finally got to the clearing that led to the bridge, and to my relief, there didn't seem to be anyone in sight. As I began to cross the bridge, I then picked up a faint scent of lavender mixed with something rancid, like the smell of a good cheese or days-old roadkill. I couldn't even tell where it was coming from, but as soon as I made it to the other side of the bridge, the environment seemed to suddenly shift. It's hard to describe, but there was this heavy pressure that washed over me. Like being submerged underwater, coupled with this gut feeling telling me that something about the environment was just off. I pushed the feeling off as a random anxiety attack, since I do get them sometimes, but deep down I knew this was different. To calm my nerves, I stopped walking and did slow breathing and began to count to ten while clenching and releasing my fist to try and shake off this bad vibe or whatever it was. When I finished my little ritual, I felt a little better and more at ease. I started to walk in the direction of my house until I heard this odd grunting sound come from behind me. I turned around, and I saw a woman with short black hair and a silky white gown crouched down with her back turned away from me. She was just a few feet away, and it was strange because when I crossed the bridge I didn't see anyone around the area. Did I pass by her without even realizing it? I thought to myself. She was hunched over after all, and I do tend to get caught up in my own little world. At this point, the faint smell from earlier was just overbearing, so much so that it started seeping into my sense of taste. I covered my mouth with the bottom of my t-shirt, trying to shield myself from it, while I yelled out the muffled words, Hello ma'am, do you need any help? She paid no mind to me as she continued to make that weird grunting sound, and I was creeped out at this point, so I walked away a couple steps and turned to get a better look at her. She then decided to stand up, still with her back turned to me, and muttered the word muerte, which means death in Spanish. Confused, trying to understand what the strange woman had said to me, she then slowly turned to meet my gaze, and all the blood in my body pooled in my gut when I saw her face. It was extremely long, too long for a normal human body to be supporting it. The head of this thing almost resembled that of a horse or a donkey's head and the eyes. I'll never forget the eyes, as much as I've tried to. They were gaping pits of blackness surrounded by a sea of red. Complete silence fell over the area as I was petrified by what I was witnessing. My brain, a scrambling mess, was trying to make sense of the unnatural abomination that was before me. The creature then decided to let out what I can only describe as a high-pitched scream like a cross between a pig squealing and a woman's wailing. My fight-or-flight reflex then kicked in and I started sprinting to my house. I didn't even bother trying to unlock the gate to my fence. I jumped over it with ease. My grandmother saw when I came barging into the house. The words wouldn't even leave my mouth to tell her what I had seen, as the fatigue quickly kicked in after the adrenaline wore off. But afterwards, I described everything to her. With a look of urgency, she then decided to perform a cleansing ritual. 
The ritual involved rubbing an egg all across my body in three circular motions while chanting a special prayer. She then cracked the egg that she was using into a clear glass cup that was half filled with water. And when she did, the egg came out with streams of blood. And the yolk that came out of the egg looked similar to a human pupil. Which is a very bad omen for the person who is being cleansed. After seeing this, she laid her hands on my forehead and chanted another prayer for about a minute and threw the raw yolk out of our house and into the driveway. She didn't bother to say anything to me until the following morning, when she reluctantly told me that what I encountered was an entity that specifically preys on men, kind of like a succubus, and told me that this thing had a very dark and malicious intent and that I was lucky to have gotten away from it. To this day, I haven't set foot on that stretch of road again. This is a story from my life that I've told to people, especially teens, to warn them to never use a Ouija board. When I was a senior in high school in 1989, my brother came home from college on spring break and told stories about him and some friends using a Ouija board. It had done some things to freak them out, so we dug out the one that we had in our attic. I don't know why we had it or where we got it from. He showed me what they had done, but nothing happened to us. I brought it to a friend's house and we tried it out a few times over the course of several evenings and then about the third or fourth time, it really started to pick up in its responses. We had been starting by knocking three times on the corner of the board and saying something like, come spirit, or something to that effect. Anyway, the marker really started to move around the board and spell things out. I always tell people that it was either our subconsciouses or a spirit moving it around, because I was certain that neither of us were moving it intentionally. With a light touch of a few fingers from each of our hands, it would just move around on its own as if it had its own personality. We would ask it all the usual questions, test questions, and curiosity ones. One day, though I wasn't a fan of it, my friend asked the board in which years we would each die. It spelled out something like 2040 or 40-ish for my friend. I don't actually remember the number, just that it was far into the future at the time. And 1990 for me, which was the next year. I asked, does that mean that I'm going to die in 1990 and my friend in 2040? No, it said. Then I asked again, this time switching the years around between us. Yes, it said. We asked the spirit about itself. It claimed that it had died the year my friend's father was born, and said that its name was Stephen Crane. We kind of laughed at that part. Of course, I looked up some dates about the author after that, but things just didn't seem to jive. I just thought, well, it could be another person with that name, and moved on. We started to invite other friends over to watch, who were all entirely skeptical. By the end of the evening, every single one was freaked out. More and more friends would come each night until we started getting a huge group of people. The board would answer plenty of test questions wrong, but then for example, while everyone's reacting to the wrong answer and half paying attention, it's spelling out, sorry. Another time, for example, in a lull between activity while people were distracted and chatting, it moved slowly to S, then kept circling around to H, 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 until it came to a stop there. There was nothing else for about two minutes. The entire room of people was completely silent, and then it slowly moved to OK. It said a bad spirit had passed through the room. Once again, everyone freaked out. It didn't like this one friend, and every time he entered the room, when we had those gatherings, the marker would twist and move to the opposite side of the board. Other things like that happened. Again, it was like it had its own personality. I remember a few times driving home with that thing in the backseat of the car, terrified, with my heart pounding. 
One time I asked it, where will I go to college? It spelled out one of the schools I was applying to, and then 37. I asked it if I was going to go to that school and get a 3.7 GPA the first semester, and it said yes. I was sure all along that my friend was not moving it intentionally, but I had proof because one day he was really disturbed and frustrated with his girlfriend, a friend of mine. He had suspected that she was cheating on him, and he asked the board a question about her while using it with a friend, and it told him to turn on the TV. The video for the song, What You Don't Know Might Hurt You, by Expose, was playing on TV. I remember that he really took that to heart, and it affected his trust in their relationship. I always knew that he wasn't just playing around with the board, and that was a sort of hard proof to that fact. We started to actually use the board with our friends, but it only worked when one of us too used it with someone else. We asked the spirit why that was, and it responded that the spirit was inside my friend and that I was the owner of the board. Freaky stuff thinking back on it now. But as an 18 year old, you think differently. Anyway, the enthusiasm started to peter out after a few months, maybe near the end of the summer, and I don't really know what happened to the Ouija board. I did end up going to that college that the board mentioned, but it didn't really catch my attention. When I got home from my first semester after 1990 had just begun, I got my grades and had a 3.7 GPA. I don't remember if I made the connection or not, but I certainly did when the next thing happened. Around the same week or so, maybe even around the same day, I got the annual catalog that my college sends out with articles and updates and whatnot. I opened it up, and there, right in front of me, was an entire article about Stephen Crane. He had gone to my college for a while, and I never had any clue about it. I remember having chills. Finally, the sad part is that later in 1990, after returning to college classes after Thanksgiving break, my friend, one of my best friends, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart problem. I don't know when I made the connection with the board, because by then it was over a year later. But at some point, I did, and when I did, I started to put the whole storyline together. It sank in more how creepy and dark the whole thing was. I am happy in life, very blessed. I did go through a form of spiritual growth some years ago where this darkness was left behind, and the story of my past doesn't haunt me. I share it in the hope that it's helpful for others, but I would never touch a Ouija board again and would strongly advise against anyone else using one. To this day, I'm still positive that it was not our conscious action at work, but either our subconsciouses or truly a spirit. Whichever of those you might believe that it is, nothing good comes from playing around with either one of them. At the minimum, negligence can open up a path for psychological and emotional problems. At worst, relating with a spirit can let in a darkness and fear beyond your understanding or strength that can tint your life and affect you for quite some time to come. I've had a few paranormal experiences in my lifetime. My mom and dad said that when I was little, they would wake up in the middle of the night to me crawling around my nursery and saying a man with glowing eyes was playing with me. They believed it was my grandfather who died when I was born a hallway away, but I haven't seen him since. Anyway, my boyfriend used to live in an old farmhouse built back in the late 1800s with roommates. None of them believed in activity, but I asked about the old barns in the house when I was staying there. I always felt unsettled in the house when I would sleep there and often would wake up at around 3.12 a.m. to pee. But one night I woke up at that time and stumbled down the hall to the bathroom. At the end of the hall was the staircase, which was creaky and old, and I heard it shift. I stopped at the bathroom door and saw the face of an older man peer around the corner. 
I jumped into the bathroom and shut the door to pee but felt goosebumps all up my arms and my back. I didn't feel afraid of him. He looked pretty nervous, but it spooked me really bad. I went back to bed and didn't see him again. The next time I stayed there, I woke up at the same time to pee and I saw him standing against the wall. But this time, he actually reached his hand out to me and motioned to go downstairs. I cautiously went towards him to see him go downstairs, and I peered around the corner to see him facing the door with his hands behind his back and staring at the open field in front of him. This time, I noticed that he was wearing glasses and was older, with a scruffy white beard and dirty pants and boots like he'd been working outside. My boyfriend came down and found me, so I went back to bed, but didn't sleep at all. The last time I saw him, I woke up at 3.12 yet again and rubbed my eyes to feel a really warm sensation around my hand, as though someone with really strong working hands was grabbing me with both of their hands, but I sat up to see nothing. My heart was beating loud, but I felt safe and calm. And I swear I heard the whisper, I'll miss you, before I went to look for him. He was in the hallway again, and he tipped his cap before whistling and walking away. I followed him, but didn't see him anywhere. And this was the last night we stayed there before we moved to a different town, into our own home. As crazy as this sounds, I miss him, and he was a sweet soul. I hope the boys that live there don't bother him too much. I asked about him after we left and visited my boyfriend's friends and they said their grandfather had died before they were alive and he was a working farmer whose wife died before him. He loved animals and wore big bottle glasses. I really think it was him and that since the boys didn't believe in ghosts that he just wanted someone to be his friend. I'll let you decide whether or not she was really a vampire. Either way, I promise that this is a true story. It happened around December 2017. I had just finished high school, and one of my friends was hosting a house party. It was out in the country. Large property, lovely view. It was a great place to celebrate the end of exams. I recognized a lot of people there and knew them quite well. However, there were two guests I didn't recognize, a boy and a girl. He was a stoic character with a solid build, not quite muscle, not quite fat, not quite someone that you would want to annoy. She was a thin figure with long amber hair and fair skin. He would scan the crowds while she shyly cradled a bottle. No one else was paying any attention to them, and I could tell they felt uncomfortable. They seemed nice enough, so I grabbed a friend and walked over to them, hoping that I could put them at ease. My friend left pretty quickly, but the girl seemed relieved that I was paying attention to them. She told me her name was Verity. Bit of an unusual name, but I thought it was pretty. Her boyfriend seemed a bit more comfortable too, but he didn't say much. I don't recall his name. Verity and I chatted for a while but I was quickly running out of small talk. I asked her about the alcohol she was drinking and what kind she prefers, that sort of thing. She replied casually, um, it's okay, but my favorite substance is blood. I think that's a good cue to run away, but my curiosity got the better of me. I asked her why she enjoyed the taste of blood. I've cut my lip before, and I remember the taste being quite sour. She told me that the flavor is dependent on a person's health. The healthier they are, the sweeter their blood. It suddenly made sense as to why her boyfriend was built like an athlete. She taught me a few weird things about hematology and was very knowledgeable about medieval execution methods. 
She explained to them with a strange fondness. It was almost nostalgia. I only knew the Viking Blood Eagle, but that was enough to get her excited. We ended up talking all night. I listened to her gore-filled lectures, and they both listened to me as well. Even though my interests and stories were much less interesting in comparison, they didn't seem to mind. They smiled and encouraged me. In between subjects, Verity would draw some blood from her boyfriend, either with her nails or her fangs. He seemed okay with it. I talked to her boyfriend for a short while, too. We got along just fine, but we had very little in common, so it was a bit tricky to hold a conversation. He was into sports and cars, so he was probably human. After a while, I tried to encourage them to meet my friends. Verity, however, didn't like that. She was very possessive and insisted that I stay with them all night. I wasn't in the mood to argue with a bloodthirsty historian, and she was being very friendly with me, so I agreed. She didn't bite me once, and I'm grateful her boyfriend was there to feed her. Maybe she was a vampire, or maybe she just had some really weird habits. Either way, I hope you enjoyed my story. This happened about a year ago in a park near my house. My brother and I are very spiritual and believe strongly in this type of stuff. I had this one Ouija board for a few years now, gifted to me by my old stepdad. We decided to use it one night and got in contact with a ghost. It went pretty well, and we did it again a week later. We talked to a new ghost, and the ghost from the first time. It was pretty cool and insane to experience something so real. They were very nice, and we were very respectful since we take this stuff seriously. Toward the end, we asked that they would not follow us home and that they would let us leave. They agreed, and we said goodbye. They moved the planchette, therefore they said goodbye with us. It seemed to be all going normal when we left, until my brother started noticing a weird feeling in our home, and on top of that, he said that one day he was hanging out in the living room and felt something in the room with him. It was on the couch where he was sitting, and he could see a cabinet door that he left open in the kitchen. He asked out loud that if someone was there to please close that cabinet door. And they did. After I got home, he told me this, and we busted out the board again. I know that you shouldn't use the board in your home, but I felt like we needed to know what was going on. We asked if the ghost who was in our home was the ghost from the park. The planchette moved to yes. Fast forward a year today, and we still live in the same house. We have a few experiences with ghosts and spirits in our home, but never the one from the park. Plus, I never go to the park anymore. My question to you guys is what made this follow us home? We did everything we were supposed to do, had a very friendly encounter, and they moved the planchette to say goodbye. I read that that's usually all that you need to do. But we did all that, and it still didn't work. I don't believe that the ghost was negative or evil, considering that they just left our home after a while. Or at least I think, since I don't feel them here anymore. My brother is convinced that the ghost was messing with us, since during the conversation when we asked their religion, they just muttered out a bunch of nonsense. I guess that could be it. But I'm wondering if there could be another reason that they followed us home. This is one of the unexplained series of events and the existence of the unknown in my very intimate environment. Location. My grandma's apartment is in one of the populous areas of Yangon's downtown, which is a 30-year-old apartment that has no record of criminal activity or any violent events whatsoever. The place? 
There's a room in this apartment that is always gloomy and subsequently felt ominous whenever a living soul would pass around it or in it. It's a typical, normal bedroom. Queen-sized bed, modern furniture, and a picture of Jesus Christ in it. Even though there's nothing abnormal about the room itself, the aura that it gave out is evil. It used to be my late grandpa's room, in which he was suffering from hepatitis C. The problem. The room itself is locked now and no one lives in it, since it used to cause the house members and guests chills whenever a person or just someone would pass around the room unexpectedly. Whenever you look inside it, there's no one. Sometimes a three-second long snickering laugh in a low tone can be heard. This can happen at any time of the day. Sometimes there's nothing at all. But whenever a person tries to lay on the bed of that room, everyone who's done it has said that they felt someone is watching them with an evil smile. But it's just their feeling, including mine. Another common denominator is that we cannot identify how that evil looks or where it came from. We all know that something is just there. What all of the house members and guests agree on is that something is watching the bed, as previously stated, with an evil smile. The aftermath. Even though no one goes near there and the room is locked since my grandpa's death, we are all worried due to the frequent sounds and laughter that we can hear at any random time. My aunt, who lives with my grandma at the same apartment, said that clapping can also be heard at a certain time of night, but not regularly. But it can't be anything from upstairs coming down, because upstairs is an empty hall that's been cleaned and locked by the previous owners until they find another renter. These events are strange since they didn't happen right away after my grandparents moved in. It started happening like a decade after they've been living there. The rest is history. I hope you all can tell me what it is. All the family members are questioning to this day. I woke up this morning to some disturbing news. My wife and I sleep in different rooms, mainly because I snore a lot and I also toss and turn due to spinal issues. It works out best for us. Lately, I've been going to bed around 4 a.m. since I'm out of a job and I prefer the quiet of the night. My wife usually gets up anywhere between 5 to 6 a.m. if the cats are bugging her to give them a little something until feed time. Don't ask me why, it's just what she does. Anyway, this morning after I woke up, she said as she walked past my room, she saw a shadow figure sitting on the corner of my bed, staring at me, and that my iPod was on. She also said she knew I was sleeping because I was snoring. Now, I usually watch something on my iPad before going to sleep, but I also keep my door mostly closed so that the light from the iPad doesn't disturb her. If she saw me, it means the door was open, as it would have been impossible otherwise. Now that part doesn't disturb me too much. We have four cats, and it's not out of the ordinary for them to push the door open. What I know 100% for a fact is that I had the door mostly closed, and the iPad was definitely in sleep mode. I always put my iPad in sleep mode, and then put my phone on the charger prior to going to sleep. My door creaks, so I would have heard it open if I were still up. This is disturbing to me because it isn't the first time a shadow man was spotted by my wife, and I spotted one before meeting her. Back in either 2008 or 2009, I was living in my first apartment. I had the scariest experience of my life. I woke up sleeping on my chest, which I never do, 
and I found my entire body was paralyzed. The only thing I could move was my eyes. Out of the corner of my left eye, I could see a shadow figure approaching me. I tried screaming, but nothing came out. I started to panic, and before I could do anything, everything went blank, and I woke up in the morning. I usually forget most of my dreams, but this event is scared into my brain. The last bit of information I want to share is something that seems odd to me, but I don't really know how to explain it. It's only happened twice in my room over the last three years. What I've seen is this strange, tan-colored dust that appears out of nowhere in a small area. The two times it happened, it wasn't in the same area, and oddly, the areas around the dust only have the typical normal dust buildup. I've checked the ceiling to see if anything came out from there, and found nothing. It's strange to me because, while I'm not a clean freak, the amount of dust makes it look like it's been building up over months, which, for that, wouldn't be the case. This may have had nothing to do with anything, but I thought it was worth mentioning. I've watched documentaries on sleep paralysis and read some medical reports. I don't know if it is or isn't a medical condition, but what gets me is that people from all over the world with various beliefs have experienced the exact same thing. Always the inability to move one's body, and always a single or multiple shadow figures. I think my paranormal story began when I was around five or six years of age. I was a shy and quiet little girl, but nothing in my life was out of the ordinary. I had both of my parents married, and a little brother three years younger than me that was sleeping in the same room as me. I don't know exactly how or when it all began, but things started to get weird at night in my bedroom. Every time my mother put me to bed and turned off the lights, shadows would begin to move around and scare me. By shadows, I mean black entities, like little insects crawling on the walls, standing figures with human shapes, even faces. I was so terrified of the night that I had a hard time falling asleep, and I can't recount how many times I had to turn on my little bed light to chase away the shadows that I was seeing. Nothing bad ever happened to me during those days. These shadows were always just passing by or staring at me, even though I recalled some times that were scarier than others. I remembered one particular night when I opened my eyes and there was just a face centimeters away from mine, staring at me with dead eyes. I was on top of a bunk bed. Every time something scary would happen to me, my instinct was to turn on a light. Everything disappeared with the light, so I made a habit to save myself like this. And now, at 26 years old, I still need to turn on the lights everywhere I go because I cannot feel at ease in the dark. Of course, I told my experiences to my parents at the time, but they did not really take me seriously. I was quite imaginative for my age, so they thought it was just my silly little brain making things up. At the same time, my vision was starting to get bad and I needed to wear glasses. They used to tell me my blurred vision was creating scary monsters with the things in my room. Every time I was seeing the things in my room, I kept repeating my parents' words to soothe me, but I was still so scared, trembling, and unable to sleep because of what I was seeing. I had bad sleeping habits because of that. I had hard times closing my eyes at night, and I always tried to fall asleep before there was no light left in the house. These experiences followed me my whole childhood but with the years passing by, they were less frequent. The fear of the dark still lingered, but I could sleep more peacefully. When I reached my teenage years, 
it completely stopped. At times, I was even able to completely forget this part of my life. Funny how I never thought my house was haunted. I always knew deep down that it was my problem to bear. The rest of my family never had any paranormal experiences in this house, and none of them were particularly inclined to hear about my fear of the shadows. Even though I stopped seeing things after my 12th or 13th birthday, I still had quite the instinct for the paranormal and I was able to feel if a place was bad or not. But I want to make it clear that I was not seeking paranormal thrills. In fact, I was avoiding those things like the plague. I was still very much traumatized and I did not want to experience scary things like that ever again. So, I cannot recall if it was during my 14th or 15th birthday years, but I had my final, most horrifying encounter. I was on vacation at my friend's grandmother's house. It was quite an old house, and there were two beds in this bedroom for my friend and me to go to sleep. I had slept in this room many nights before without anything happening, and nothing during the evening could explain what took place next. I woke up in the middle of the night with no explanation. I don't remember having a bad dream or hearing something. I just opened my eyes in the complete darkness. The feeling of uneasiness crept in very quickly. Something was not right. I could feel it, but I wasn't sure what yet. I finally lifted my head and saw it. Words cannot describe how horrid the thing I saw was, and how terrified I felt in that instant. Just two meters away from me, at the end of my bed, stood a man that I can only describe as grotesque. The man had red skin, or so I thought at first, prominent eyes, and an all-teeth smile. It was standing still and staring directly at me. We looked at each other for what felt like hours with no one moving. I was able to see every detail of it. More than ten years later, I'm able to describe it perfectly to you. Its image is still ingrained in my brain like I was marked by a hot iron. Its red skin was actually no skin at all. It was made out of muscles, and its eyes and teeth were very apparent because it had neither eyelid nor lip. Its face was horribly deformed because there were several metal pieces under its muscles that were coming out at random places. It wore a black leather trench coat. I cannot tell you how terrified that I was. My heart plummeted to my stomach and my body felt an uncomfortable hotness within. It was the first time that I was seeing something so vivid and real, and my instincts were screaming that I was in great danger. I could not take my eyes off of the red man. Somehow I knew that I should not let it out of my sight. I didn't scream or panic but I frantically searched for the light switch that I knew was within reach. The red man was standing still, just looking back at me. I don't know why, but I knew that it was completely amused by the situation and how scared that I was. Finally, I turned on the light, and I thought that I was saved. Remember how the light always helped me chase away the shadows? Well, this time, it did not fucking work. It was still there. It was still staring at me, and I could see it more clearly than ever. It began to shift away, getting closer to my friend's bed. Speaking of my friend, of course he woke up from the light that I had just turned on. He turned toward me, asking me what was happening. I think he knew immediately that something was very wrong from the face that I was probably making and my eyes locked on something next to his bed. He kept turning his head toward the red man that I was looking at, but he obviously was not able to see it. 
My friend kept asking what was wrong again and again, more panicked each time he was inquiring. I was so horrified that my lips were sealed so I was not able to respond. The whole event took less than a minute to unfold, but here I was completely terrified and spooking my friend to death. Finally, the red man began to fade away into thin air. During all this time, it did not break eye contact with me. It did not move its arms or its legs. It just kept staring at me with its eyes, with no eyelids, and staring at me with no lips. To this day, I have no explanation for it. It was neither a vivid dream, nor a sleep paralysis, and I know what I saw. To further validate my experience, let me tell you another weird thing I experienced not many years ago related to this story. After forgetting about this horrible nightmare for a decade, I happened to tell the story to my father. I was still very surprised by how vividly I could recall the events of that night and how I could describe its face precisely. I was in an almost trance-like state while taking a bath after that, still thinking about what had happened. I was recreating the red man's face in my head. I began to stare at my own face in the mirror, a mirror that was at least two and a half meters away from me. I stared at myself for minutes without really thinking about it, just having the red man's face in mind. Somehow, a feeling of uneasiness began to stir in me. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was at first. I kept staring at my face, in my trance-like state, until I finally realized what was not right with the situation. I was able to see my face. Remember how I told you my eyesight was bad? Well, it did not improve with time. In fact, it got really bad, and without my glasses, I can't see things clearly at all. And here I am, in my bathtub, seeing things clearly for the first time since my toddler years. I got really spooked, and the moment that I realized what was happening, I saw my vision getting blurrier and blurrier. I don't know what to make of the last story. I just wanted to tell you everything that happened to me. I have my own theories, but, again, I do not seek any truth, and I still avoid paranormal things like the plague. Well, that's about it, folks. I hope my experience was interesting to some of you. It was weird and unsettling for me to put words to these events. I feel like every time I mention these things, I put myself closer to the shadows and the red man that still haunt my nightmares to this day. As I said before, I did not experience anything relevant after my teenage years, but the fear of the dark and what it hides is still here. When I was in middle school, I went to a friend's birthday party sleepover where we did the typical girl things like painted nails, did makeovers, and watched a movie. It was all normal until my friend suggested that we make a Ouija board. On a sheet of paper, we scribbled out yes, no, goodbye, along with numbers and the alphabet. She told us all the rules, and we nodded in agreement that we would follow. I remember the first movement happening, and I looked across to the girl facing me, insisting that she had moved it. She said that it was not her that moved the clear pebble that we were all using as a planchette. We asked it dumb questions like who we each liked and if our crushes liked us. Typical middle school girl things. I don't remember much of these sessions other than a particular name, Wanda, and that we had asked her if she was a demon and that she had told us that she was not. After a while, this was no longer scary and we began to enjoy it more and more. I remember feeling so excited, like I just wanted to keep on playing as if it were a video game. The next day, I told my dad about it. 
My family was pretty open-minded about those things, so he wasn't mad or ashamed. He just wanted to make sure that we were all safe about it. Fast forward and I was in my first year of college over at a friend's place for her birthday and she had talked about how she found a Ouija board and that we should try it. I was a little hesitant as now I realized the true implications. We eventually started setting boundaries, but I was still hesitant to believe that the planchette was actually moving on its own. My friend asked questions like, when's my birthday and what's my name? I shifted to questions not about myself, tending to ask about the entity rather than me. My friend suddenly asked if the spirit knew my deceased grandfather's name and it spelled out Lewis. I was in shock because none of my friends could have known that. I know that I hadn't directed the planchette to the letters, so I was surprised to see that it was correct. Later on, another friend of mine had said that she felt something grab her foot under the table. I was right next to her, and I didn't feel a thing. At that point, I was like, okay, let's say goodbye and call it a night. It was all just too weird. I've never had a truly bad experience, but it's still very creepy, to say the least. Last night, I was turning off all of the lights and getting ready for bed. I just had my flashlight from my phone to do some tidying up in the kitchen. I turn it off and go walk into the bedroom. Across from the kitchen, in the living room, there is a shadow. This was something that was different from the usual, as it clearly caught my attention. It was something that looked like a long shape peering in from the upper right side of the window as if it was a long neck or just some weird shape, definitely abnormal. I was genuinely afraid and kept turning the lights on and off to see when I could see it. It was only when it was completely black inside and the street light and neighbor's porch lights were slightly illuminating the window. I tried to look out, but could only see myself in the blinds and it really freaked me out. So I left the lamp by the window on, and after debating, I told myself not to wake my partner up because realistically it's nothing, and what could it be? I mean, we're on the second floor. It seemed really close to the window, and it wasn't moving. I'm not one to believe in paranormal activities. In fact, every time I watch scary YouTube videos that claim to be true and have paranormal shadows or movements, I instantly think it's not true and get annoyed. Walking tonight with my partner, I remembered the situation from last night. I saw nothing on the outside that would show through the window and create the shape that I saw. I quickly went inside with him to see what I could see from the inside with all the lights out again. I was expecting to see it there, and that it was something that I just never noticed before. But it was gone. The window looks completely normal, and the lights outside are the same as they always are. I'll never know what it was. And next time, I will definitely be waking up my partner if I see it. This is a long one, but this is a true and factual story about my experience. I'd like to start by saying that I'm very skeptical when it comes to things people claim are paranormal. I don't just jump to conclusions that a strange event is caused by spirits. But some things I just can't wrap my head around or explain. I won't say that what happened to me and what I experienced was from a spirit, because I don't know 100%. All I know is that I'll never touch a Ouija board again, or be around one because the experience disturbed me for the better part of a year. Also, I'd like to add that this is only one of two paranormal events that I've ever personally experienced that I can say 100% that I don't know what happened. Here we go, starting with the background. I used to think that Ouija boards were a load of crap. I still kind of do. I really don't know how I feel about them anymore, actually. I always saw them as a party game for gullible people, so when my friend Joe, 
not his real name for privacy, told me that he had one, I just laughed it off. I had only known Joe for about a year or so after meeting through mutual friends. He lived in a small apartment with his girlfriend Lisa, also not her real name, and their dog Vincent. At the time I was only 18. Joe was like 23 and Lisa was 20. For a period of time I used to go over to their place every weekend after work because Joe bought me alcohol. So one night we were hanging out, and Joe starts talking about some strange encounters he had growing up and how he, quote unquote, attracted spirits his whole life or some garbage. I smiled and nodded to be polite while he went off on paranormal tangents and started talking about shadow people following him. He then goes into his room and pulls out a Ouija board, but not the one that you get at a store made by a toy company. It was made of real wood and hand carved. It was actually pretty nice. He said that he had gotten it as a birthday gift from his parents years ago because of his obsession with the paranormal. I didn't inquire as to where it had come from or who made it, but like I said, it looked handmade. While I sat there laughing and joking about it, Lisa chimes in and says, Joe, tell him about the other night. Joe proceeds to tell me how him and Lisa allegedly spoke to a demon using it, and the demon claimed that his name was Beelzebub. Me being a big metalhead at the time, he got my attention. Let's do it. Let's try to talk to this demon, I said, half joking. Joe asked if I was sure that I wanted to try it, and I agreed. So we went into his room. We turned off all the lights in the apartment. Lisa lit candles all around the room and we sat on the floor. I was nervous, but I was having fun watching Lisa and Joe's pageantry. It was spooky. I looked over at Joe and he seemed unsettled. I asked what was wrong, and he said that he wasn't feeling right. He didn't like the doors open displaying the darker areas of the apartment. Him and I got up and closed every door in the place, as in every room and every closet. We sat back on the floor and Vincent, the pup, laid on the bed. And we began. I forgot to add, this is very important. Before we started, I told Joe that I was skeptical of someone using their fingers to push the planchette around. So we all agreed to just use the back of our fingernails to touch it. Imagine just slightly bending your finger and placing the surface of your nail on the top. That's what we did. That way, even if you added pressure, your finger just slipped around on the planchette and didn't actually move it. We also made a rule. If the planchette moves, everyone has to lightly scratch the planchette with their nail to prove that none of us were the ones making it happen. What it looked similar to is placing your two fingers on a table and acting like their legs and running in place. I hope that helps you get the picture. No one was able to move it on their own. We tried several times to ask if there were spirits with us and got nothing. For about 20 minutes it continued that way. I told Joe I wanted to ask for someone in particular. Is John Smith here with us? Can John Smith talk to me? John Smith, obviously once again not his real name, was the name of my best friend's dad who was killed in a car crash while driving home from a fishing trip. That was when it moved. And it was absolutely insane. It felt like a great force just came to life in the planchette, like it had a mind of its own. None of that gliding around the board crap that you see in movies. This thing felt like we were holding onto a person's hand who was tugging and pulling. It was strong, but articulate movement, and it spelled out, hello. I asked him if he was John, and it spelled, yes. I asked him to prove it, and it spelled out the name of my best friend. I asked him where he was when he passed, and he spelled lake. I had chills down my spine. What I thought was just going to be fun had turned into being emotional and scary. Joe and Lisa knew nothing about John Smith. I never mentioned him or brought up anything about the circumstances, so they couldn't have known. I began to grow very unsettled. I told Joe and Lisa that I didn't want to talk to John anymore, so they told me to push the planchette to goodbye or whatever it was. I called it a night after that, but I wanted more. Next night, I was back. 
Same routine, John and Lisa set up the room. John closed all the doors. Vincent was on the bed. Lisa said that she wanted to talk to her grandma, so we did the process. It was the same incident for her as it was for me. Memory is kind of fuzzy, but it spelled out I love you, and also spelled out some sort of inside joke that she used to share with her grandmother. Lisa was in tears. As with me, I had no info on her grandma, and Joe wasn't that cruel to make her cry as a joke. I felt powerful. I think we all did. I felt like I was finally a believer, that we had an actual way of talking to spirits. The possibilities. But then, it happened. After the incident with Lisa's grandma, we were all kind of in shock. Joe was comforting Lisa, and I was speechless. We regained our composure and got back to it. This time we were asking the normal, are there any spirits with us? What usually left the planchette lifeless suddenly kicked in with great force. Scary force. The planchette moved violently around the board. We all kind of laughed nervously. We asked, who are you? The planchette shot to the moon symbol. If you don't know, this allegedly means a dark spirit. We all looked at each other and then simultaneously moved the planchette to goodbye. As soon as we did, Vincent jumped up and ran off of the bed. He sat and stared as if looking at someone. We had that door closed before. Joe jumped up and said, F this, and ran into the kitchen. Lisa and I followed. Joe about nearly had a panic attack. He rushed to turn on all the lights. I've never seen him act that way. We were all pretty scared. We don't know what happened, but we had that door closed for sure. After some talking and calming each other down, I left. I didn't sleep that night. I had never seen anything like that. After that night, I felt like I was being followed constantly. For almost a year, I slept with the lights on. That year ended up being one of the worst years of my life. I fell into a depression and was incredibly paranoid. I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was always watching me. I continued to go to Joe and Lisa's place occasionally, but we never touched the board again. We ended up having a falling out some months later over unrelated drama and never communicated after that. Like I said, that year was horrible for me. I started drinking a lot and tried to get over the feeling. I always felt like my energy was being sapped like the air was heavy, and I struggled to find joy. The depression was real. Then the experience hit a peak. I was sleeping one night and woke up in a panic. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if someone was literally sitting on my chest. I gasped for air. Suddenly, I felt like what was someone grabbing my feet and trying to pull me off of my bed. I instantly went into a struggle, trying to kick out as hard as I could. Then all at once, it stopped. I was horrified. Nobody was in my room. I lost even more sleep after that incident. I ended up finally getting a hold on my life. I started going to the gym instead of drinking and wallowing in my pity. I started meditating instead of playing video games. After that year, it all went away. It was like I was free from that negative energy again, and I have been fine ever since. That's the story of my Ouija board experience. I'm still not sure if all of it was in my head, or if that night was just some sort of stress-induced panic attack, but whatever it was, I cannot explain it. People have told me that demons thrive off your energy, and that that is what might have happened, but I'm just not sure. Perhaps it was the demon talking to us all along, pretending to be our loved ones, if such a thing exists. I'm just glad that whole experience is in my past. I'll never touch a Ouija board again, though. This happened in 2011. 
Back then I was very engaged in political activism and I ended up organizing an Occupy movement in the city I was living in, along with some other fellows. We camped in a downtown square for about four months, and throughout this period a lot of people came in and out. By the second month I had to travel to another city where my parents were living for a week. When I came back to the occupation, there was a guy living there that had arrived exactly when I had left. He had somehow already had some respect from other people in a very short period of time. He was tall, blonde, long hair, a bit hippie, had a profound voice that implied self-confidence. He had by some means a strange aura. But okay, no big deal, seemed like a cool guy after a while. Over time, he became my friend, and we ended up having long conversations about pretty much everything that interested me and vice versa, like occultism, magic, UFOs, etc., until he brought up the vampirism subject, which I was not familiar with at the time. He explained to me some stuff like that vampires were basically normal people that could manage their own life force, and apparently they have been misinterpreted since always. He told me that there were some secret vampire groups, small ones, that preserved the rituals. There was no blood-sucking thing going on as he said that blood was an analogy to life force. They were not actually sucking it from people, but they could indeed take somebody's life force. But more important, he said, was to know how to use your own. The conversation finished there. The whole thing seemed fascinating to me, and after a while, we went to sleep. Some days later, here's what happened. My house was quite close to the occupation, and once in a while, some of my friends would often ask me to use the bathroom or to have a shower, and then this guy asked me the same. I said yes, no problem at all. Everything went fine, the guy had his shower, and we were walking back to the occupation, and he brought up the subject about vampirism again. This time he was wearing an anonymous plastic mask, which completely covered his face. He starts to explain to me how one can control their own life force inside dreams, and how would that affect the actual material body. Meanwhile, as he's explaining that, I see his jaw making a strange movement, as if there was something stuck between his teeth, and he was trying to clean it. When he finishes the explanation, he calls me by my name and raises the mask slightly so I can take a look at his mouth. And then, I saw this huge canine tooth. He pulled the mask back down quickly. I didn't know how to react, so I just remained calm and I asked him what was that for if they didn't actually suck blood from other people. He told me that it worked out as a sort of antenna to capture different vibrations and he managed to construct it by molding his life force into that shape inside his dreams. He asked me if I would be interested in doing the same. I told him that it sounded interesting, and he just left me to think about it. We arrived at the occupation as if nothing had happened. I didn't see any strange movements by his hands trying to insert a fake tooth into his mouth, or trying to remove it after. The sensation I got was that he pulled the tooth out by a jaw movement. The whole thing was just very strange to digest. I had no idea what to do, so I called my friend and he just said that the whole story sounded too crazy to be believable. We still lived together in the occupation for a while, but I never brought up the subject again. The guide totally noticed my attempt to avoid it, so he didn't push me on it either. There was another strange fact after a while. Once he was shirtless and crouched organizing some stuff inside of his tent, and the muscles on his back formed into the shape of a winged dragon. The occupation eventually finished, and that guy ended up dating a girl that he met there, and they both had a kid together. He seemed pretty normal, despite those two occasions. This happened to my dad, who told me this story when I accidentally discovered a Ouija board in a closet in our house. He was living in Spain at the time, and during the 1970s, he bought that Ouija board. 
He told me that one day he talked too much with a wise entity who responded to everything so clearly and philosophically. The thing is, my dad asked it, where are you? And the board started to mark random numbers and letters such as 165, 2AC, 8820, that kind of thing. My dad, who was consternated, thought that it was decontextualized. Nonetheless, and he cannot explain why, he wrote down the entire random series of numbers. And he cannot explain why, he wrote down the entire random series of numbers and letters on a paper that he had left sitting on a shelf. The disturbing part after that is that a few years during the 1980s, later, my dad was watching Cosmos with Carl Sagan, and he told me that in that show, Sagan explained that scientists had discovered a new galaxy that was called with a sequence of numbers and letters. My dad was so impressed. So he copied down the name of the show and he looked for the paper on the shelf. And yes, it was the same sequence. My dad is fascinated with this experience and told me that the Ouija is not just spiritual, it is also interdimensional. When he told me, I was between scared and curious, and I considered aliens using the Ouija board. He still believes that this wise entity is up there somewhere talking with others. My parents have owned a tavern slash restaurant for 14 years in my small town. My father is someone who likes to start new projects and is a well-known person in our town. One day he was contacted by the local realtor to offer my father a private showing of a historical hotel that had been up for sale. This hotel has been around for decades and went from hotel to restaurant to bar with little success. Everyone who had owned it before put it back on the market within a year. The bank had the title now, and the realtor told my father, if you don't plan to buy it and fix it up, they're going to rip it down. A lot of people in the town thought that the only person who could save it was my father, so he bought the hotel. My parents kept the downstairs bar and renovated the upstairs for apartments. This is when odd things started to happen. My father would come home almost every night with the camera footage to show my mom and I. The footage always showed an empty pool room with small, random orbs floating in the foreground. My father is a believer in the paranormal, but my mother is not, so her and I both chalked it up to bugs and dust. Although I will agree, the way the orbs zigzagged around the room was weird, but it still seemed like nothing. A month goes by and my father comes home early on a Sunday from working down at the hotel. He walked into the house, looking spooked something my father rarely ever is. He detailed out how he was behind the bar, checking on receipts from the night before when he heard footsteps approaching from the hallway entrance. We don't open on Sunday, but if someone my dad knew saw his truck in the parking lot, they would just walk in to see him. So he didn't find the footsteps odd at all. Without looking up from his receipts, he called out, We're not open, but give me a sec. He heard the footsteps enter the bar room and take six more steps toward him before stopping. Taking another second to finish going over the last night's shift, he looked up and peered around the wooden support beam and there was no one. He said he got out of there so fast he doesn't even remember locking the door behind him. My mom obviously thinks he's crazy, but I am freaked. That place always gave me the creeps, but my father confirming my fears made me want to never step foot in that building again. Two days ago, my mom had an experience there that sent her out the door faster than my dad. She was in the bar room before opening hours collecting the shift money from the night before. She wasn't there for more than five minutes before she started to hear the faint sound of music coming from the entrance hallway. She said she ignored it for a while, assuming it was one of the tenants upstairs. After collecting the money, she went to leave and the music started getting louder. She said it sounded like old waltz music, piano-based, and that it was clear as day. The further she walked down the hall toward the bedrooms, the more prominent the noise became. As she stepped in front of the women's restroom, she said it sounded like someone was in there playing the music on their phone. 
By this time, my mom was sufficiently freaked out and ran out of rational reasoning behind what it could be. Just as she was about to open the door, she said she heard the water turn on and off twice before she left the building. In the parking lot, she called my dad to come down, certain that someone had been in there with her. But when he came to check it out, no one was there. Now my mom is a believer, and we are both properly terrified of that creepy old hotel. I was raised to understand and live in harmony with the paranormal. There were a lot of spirits and odd happenings surrounding me when I was younger. I've never really liked being alone in the dark, but I don't remember being afraid of anything supernatural until one night. I was about 13, and we had recently moved into my aunt's old house. I immediately disliked the house, and especially my room. They just felt wrong. Still, we set everything up. We put my four-poster bed against the wall in such a way that my headboard was in a corner and my footboard sat right against the light switch. So, if I laid on my bed and looked down, I saw the light switch, doorway, and top of the footboard. I had a big window to my right with a street light just outside it. My bedroom door wouldn't close and the hallway light stayed on. Anyway... I started to see shadowy figures during the day and night, but that was pretty normal. I woke up a few nights to tiny footsteps and cackling. I assumed they were goblins being annoying. I always felt watched. The first night something seemed wrong, I woke up hanging halfway off of my bed. I couldn't see any light or figure out how I was even laying. Finally, I found my footboard. I reached out much further than the switch should have been and turned on the bedroom light. As soon as I touched the switch, I could see the street and hallway lights again. About two nights later, I woke up just in time to see a dark figure appear over my footboard. It looked like a man's head and shoulders with thick black material draped over it. There were no facial features and the blackness continued like it had a body, but no arms or anything. When I think back, it reminds me of the Dementors from Harry Potter, but it slithered up over my footboard. I could feel the weight, and I could move, but it seemed like a bad idea. So I closed my eyes. I felt the weight continue up to my chest, pause, and disappear. I opened my eyes, and it was gone. I felt strangely better in the house after that, and I haven't seen it since. It was still one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. I don't know what it was, or who it was looking for. Most of this stuff happened to me between the ages of 10 and 18. I've posted before about my haunted school, and I'd like to share more of what I've heard. Whatever these things are, they have really enjoyed screwing with me periodically. I was 17 and had just gotten home from some event, either with a church group or some friends, I don't recall. It was about 11 p.m., and as mandated, I woke my parents up to let them know that I was home and alive. Don't remember why I felt the need to shower that night, but I did. The shower was a stall with a glass door and really high-pressure steam, which was almost deafening in that plastic stall. You would have to shout at me right next to the bathroom door in order for me to hear you. So that's why what happened next was so shocking. Mid-shower, there was this loud, blood-curdling female scream that I could hear from inside the shower. I had never heard someone scream like that in real life, and it paralyzed me for a second. 
I have two sisters, and so I immediately thought the worst. I busted out of the shower, ran to my parents' room, dripping wet, wearing only a towel, fully expecting my parents to be getting up to see who was screaming. The house wasn't that big, just a double-wide trailer with an addition. I was shocked to find them in bed asleep still. Their door was open. If I heard the scream, then they should have really heard it, especially since neither of them are heavy sleepers. I woke them quickly and asked if they had heard that scream, which they didn't. Mom was concerned and Dad hopped out of bed and we checked on my siblings. All sound asleep. So then we searched the house and even looked outside. Nothing. He usually gets annoyed and upset when I talk about the paranormal. He had to exercise some evil spirit from a room when he was on his mission at age 20, so he prefers to have them just not exist at our house at all. And no scary movies. But this time he was pretty calm, probably because he could tell how upset that I was. I wasn't dreaming, hallucinating, or making it up. And he knew it. I was standing naked with a towel nearly hyperventilating and still dripping from the shower. Dad tried to comfort me, telling me it was probably just a cat outside. Yeah, really. He didn't believe it, but that's what he was selling, so I better buy it. I really had nothing else to do but go to bed. Down in the basement where most of the activity occurred. But you bet your butt I didn't sleep much. Whatever it was that was screaming would bug me periodically. I was the only one in the basement, so naturally, I was the only witness. I have lots of stories that my family still won't believe. This is a 100% true story that happened to me when I was about 12. I lived in a really small town in central Wisconsin with my family. My mom had gotten divorced when I was eight, but it was her and her boyfriend and all my siblings in the house, minus the three oldest. I had finally gotten my own room since the three oldest moved out and was so excited, but for the first couple months, I didn't sleep in there because I was too scared. So I would sleep with my sister in her room. As we were getting ready to move out of that house, I finally worked up the courage to sleep in my room by myself. My bed was positioned so that when I laid down on my back, I was facing the door. This night in particular, I had kept the bedroom door open because it was a really warm summer night. I remember waking up sometime in the night. I have no idea what time it was, nor do I think I would remember even if I had looked. Anyway, when I woke up, I turned over onto my back and happened to glance outside my door. When I did, I saw this black silhouette of a man who I thought looked just like Abraham Lincoln. Tall, thin, with what looked like a top hat and a beard. He was standing right outside my door next to the railing that led to the stairs. I remember staring for a moment, but getting freaked out and covering my head with the blanket and going back to sleep. Fast forward about a year to where we were moved into our new house, a small mobile home in the middle of nowhere, and I had a dream. In the dream, I was back in the old house, my childhood home. I remember all I could think was, I'm home. It felt so calm, so familiar. Everything was exactly how I remembered it, down to my messy room. In my dream, I went exploring through the house, reminiscing. I was so glad to be back, but then I woke up. It was such a nice dream, but I eventually forgot about it. And that was when I had my second dream. It was roughly a month or so later. I was back in my old home, but something was off. As I was walking through, I realized that things were missing. The china cabinet in the dining room was gone, and so was the stereo we had in the living room, and so on. Just little things. It didn't feel as familiar or as happy as the last dream that I had had, but when I woke up yet again and, just like the last time, I eventually forgot about it. Fast forward again to probably two or three months later and I had another dream. 
I was back in my childhood home, surprise, surprise, and again things were missing and the whole energy just felt off. I remember feeling very uneasy and uncomfortable there, but I couldn't leave. And then I saw it again. The Abraham Lincoln looking shadow that I had seen a year before. He was just wandering the halls upstairs. I got really freaked out and tried to leave, but then I woke up again. And again, I forgot about the dream not too long after. Finally, just a few short months later when I was staying at my grandparents' house, I had what would be the last dream. I was back in my old home again, and this time, everything was gone. The whole house was empty. It probably looked like that because that was how it looked the last time I saw it, right before we officially left. But anyway, I was walking through the house feeling so creeped out, and again like last time, just wanting to leave. It no longer felt like home. Then there was this man, or figure. It didn't look like the shadow that I had seen before, but I couldn't make out any features either. He asked me if I was okay, and I said no, and that I wanted to leave. Then he asked, would you like to leave with me? And held out his hand. I got such a bad feeling from him that I said no. He started promising me that if I went with him that I could go back to my childhood home, back to what was so familiar and happy to me. But I refused, and then I woke up. After that, I told my sister everything. From the shadow man that I saw first, to all the dreams that I had. At first, we thought that maybe I was having some sort of psychic visions, but a few years later, I found out the truth. I found out that the silhouette that I saw was a shadow person after I watched a video by Haley Reese on what they are. Then a couple more years later, after meeting my boyfriend, whose whole family is very into the supernatural, I found out what the whole thing actually meant. He explained to me that demons often come to you in dreams to attempt to possess you. They'll start by creating a situation that's familiar and comforting. But after a dream or two, they start adding or taking things away, slowly, so as not to make it obvious. You start to become uncomfortable and threatened and scared, until one time they're the only thing that makes you feel safe. And that's when they have you. They'll promise you everything good you could ever want, and as soon as you say yes, you're saying yes to them taking over your body. My boyfriend explained that I was very smart for saying no, and for telling my sister. Because by telling my sister, I basically broke the demon's hold. That's apparently why back in the old days, people would tell their dreams to someone. Because it basically breaks the hold of whatever demon or spirit may be trying to possess you. I was 19 years old and a trainee manager for Sainsbury's, a UK supermarket chain. I was working with a colleague on the shop floor, looking down the aisle. I saw a 30-something-year-old mother pushing a very severely deformed child in a wheelchair. Although I wasn't aware then, but since have become aware. I wasn't aware then, but since have become aware that the child had probably been born with hydrocephalus, leaving its head distended with fluid. The child also only had one arm, and was sort of curled up in the chair as if pained. As they, passed us, we pull as they passed us, we pulled our restocking trolley out of the way, and just as they were adjacent to us, the child let out a terrible sort of howl. To be honest, it left me shaken for several minutes. Two or three days later on the weekend, I was invited to a party at a friend's place. Just a quiet meal and drinks with a few people that I knew. After food and a few drinks, the girl whose flat it was suggested that we try the Ouija board that she had recently bought. I was a total skeptic of the Ouija, although agreed to play for a bit of fun. It was a proper sort of wooden painted board, although there was no pointer, just a small crystal glass that those playing put their finger on. 
after about 20 minutes in. I thought it felt a bit odd the way that the glass felt like it was gliding so smoothly over the board and actually spelling out some of the responses to questions and even claiming to be a local spirit of our town. We carried on for a while and, although weird, nothing about the responses were threatening or unpleasant. My friend turned to me and said, ask it a question that nobody here or anyone else would know the answer to. I thought for a few seconds and spoke aloud. I was thinking of the child in the store, and I said, what did I see at work the other day? I felt the glass move under our fingers and it said quickly, very positively, effing evil troll child. I felt physically sick and was actually heaving. I jumped away and fell onto the floor. I then blacked out for a few minutes, resulting in my friends calling an ambulance in panic. When it arrived, I had calmed down a bit and they just checked my vitals and left. My friend drove me home and although I was alright, I had nightmares involving that child for several months. Today I believe that there are definitely consequences to messing with that sort of stuff and it is absolutely best left well alone. That was over 25 years ago and I remember that incident as if it happened just yesterday. When I was around 12, maybe 13 years old, I'm 24 now, I was staying at my dad's house for the weekend. We watched movies and ate junk food, a usual occurrence when I got to see him. My brother was also usually with us, but this time he was staying with a friend that night. I decided it was time for bed around 11 that evening. I went for my routine, getting ready for bed. He decided that it was time for bed around 11 that evening, and I went about my usual routine, getting ready for sleep. I laid down and tried to pass out. I was restless this night for some reason, just feeling completely uneasy. My bed used to be vertical to the door with my feet closest to the door. I always used to sleep with my door open. I guess it gave me some comfort being able to see half of the entrance to my dad's door, knowing that he wasn't far away. Anyway, as I said, I just couldn't get to sleep, and frustrated, I laid there staring at my ceiling for a moment, and then felt as if someone were watching me. I shifted my eyes to the doorway, and a pitch black figure was standing there, its head almost touching the top of the frame. I've never had an issue with sleep paralysis, and never have had it since, but then, in that moment, I could not move. All I could do was look at this tall figure that stood there, staring at me. Tears began to flow down my cheeks, and my heart felt as if it were going to beat out of my chest. I managed to barely whisper, Dad? And it turned its head sideways at me as if it were confused. I began hyperventilating intensely, which must have woken my dad because he came running into my room, and as he came through the door, the figure dissolved as if a breeze came by, and it went away with it. My dad held me as I cried. I slept in his room that night, and for the rest of my stay there until I went back to my mom's. This event shook me to my core, and to this day, I cannot and will not sleep with an open door. I still have a deep feeling of fear, and almost want to cry when I picture that thing and remember that night. This happened about three years ago, but has really affected how I think about ghosts and the paranormal ever since. When I tell my friends, some of them find it very creepy, while others say they don't believe in any supernatural things, and while it is odd, they feel there must be some other explanation. I took a family vacation, me, my parents, and two siblings, over Christmas. 
All of us were already adults at this time, and while my family is agnostic and holds out judgment for the afterlife, none of us are religious or believe that there is a true afterlife with heaven or hell. That said, my parents thought it would be fun for us to stay at a haunted hotel in Jerome, Arizona on our way to a resort town further down the road. This whole town is supposedly haunted, but especially the hotel, which used to be a mental hospital that has long since been converted. We checked in and were given two of the most supposedly haunted suites because we needed two large adjoining rooms for everyone to fit. So far, everything was normal until we got to the room. My mom and sisters suddenly smelled something they described as putrid in a spot in one of our rooms. I couldn't smell it, so dismissed it and moved on. We took a walk around the town, and I asked a bakery owner about the haunted stories, and she said it's just accepted that sometimes things fly off her shelves at home, but nothing hostile. Here is where the weird stuff starts. We signed up for the nighttime tour of the hotel in a large-ish group of people and we were all given electromagnetic readers while we walked around and heard the stories of the mental patients that died there. Halfway through the tour, my dad and sister hear a sound and turn around to see the doorknob of the room next to them shaking and rattling incessantly. I didn't personally see it, so by this time I was getting bored. I always thought it would be cool if ghosts existed, but didn't really believe they can do anything to affect the physical world. I asked my sister to take some Instagram pictures of me in a cool looking couch in one of the haunted suites, and she took some quick shots. I passed my hand over the table in front of me to pose, when I felt an extremely cold, chilling sensation in my hand and wrist, and told her to stop. When I looked at the photos, I was shocked. I have a series of three pictures where you can see that I'm switching around with a startled look on my face, shaking my hand, and there's a white cloud streaking through my hand and wrist in the photos that appears and disappears throughout the three frames. Needless to say, I was frightened. I was no longer willing to sleep on my own, so I took the bed with my mom. Yeah, sad, I know. My dad and sister slept a bit and went to walk around in the middle of the night in the boiler room where they said they had felt some weird stuff. I don't remember exactly what happened, but one of them felt a strong chill on their back. Meanwhile, I was sleeping and my mom suddenly woke and slammed her hand on the dresser. She said sorry and went back to sleep. She's never been a sleep mover, but whatever. I slept pretty deeply that night, but I kept being woken up by a super loud, clanking, rattling sound in the halls that sounded like the gurneys being wheeled back and forth. This is not a busy hotel, and in the middle of the desert. In the morning, my mom said she had a dream that there was a little boy and a young nurse talking to him. Then the nurse aged and became mean and scowling and raised her hand to hit the boy. She said she then heard a voice telling her to hit him herself. This is why she hit the dresser. Keep in mind that this was a mental hospital, and one of the ghosts there is supposed to be a little boy, but no one knows why or how he died. A few nights ago, I awoke to being restrained by what I can only describe as a vampire. I'm familiar with the paranormal, but this was a particularly impressive experience. I was pinned to my bed, trapped underneath the body of a young woman. It was as if she was trying to bite me, but at the same time doing everything in her power to stop herself. Or, she was doing her best to bite me, but something was preventing her from being able to. She was struggling and jerking, breathing rapidly and kind of growling and snorting. The way she was moving, it was almost as if she was on fast forward. Her teeth were grazing my neck with her mouth wide open. I could feel them against my skin, but was sure that they never penetrated. I was unable to break free and struggled in fear, but realized that I couldn't get away, so just gave in and embraced her. When I embraced her, I found that I actually felt an overwhelming love, despite the disturbing nature of the experience. 
I had a very clear image of what she looked like. She had long, wavy hair and somehow resembled myself. I could also feel her intention. Even though she was doing something violent, it was clear to me that she was good at heart. Eventually, because I was alternatively struggling against her, I did break free, and she disappeared. I had a similar experience to this around a year ago where I awoke to a dark, humanoid shadow being standing beside me, manipulating my energy. That being, however, I felt was inherently evil. This vampiric entity, on the other hand, didn't give off a sinister vibe. It just seemed to me that she was trapped in some kind of karma, unable to control herself. I know about the sleep paralysis demon phenomenon, and that there is supposed to be logical explanation for these occurrences. Honestly, I completely disbelieved in anything supernatural for most of my life. After everything I've experienced, though, it's impossible to deny that these kinds of things are real. When I was about 15 years old, I was a very curious teenager. I had only heard stories of the Ouija board, but had never actually tried it. So one weekend, my best friend slept over, and we decided to take our chances. My mom was super against me buying one, and she would have killed me if I would have brought one into her home. So my best friend and I took a big poster board and made our own Ouija board. We lit candles and turned off all the lights. It was about 1 a.m., and everyone in the house was asleep. When we started out, it was slow, but then the planchette started moving all around the board. I was convinced that my best friend was the one moving the piece around, but she denied it, and I trusted her not to lie. We asked how they died, and they just said, sick. After a bunch of other questions, we asked, how can you prove that you are who you really say that you are? They responded with, cemetery. I don't fully remember all the questions that we asked, but I know that it led to Charlie giving us some details. He said that his gravestone was by a path and a tree, small, round, with the year 1820. My mom's house is literally right across the street from a cemetery. I can look out the window and directly into it, so we are very, very close. It is an extremely old, historical colonial cemetery dating back to 1690. The next day, my best friend and I went over to the burial ground and started our wild goose chase for Charlie's headstone. Lo and behold, we found it. It was exactly as he described. His headstone was cylinder-shaped, the name Charlie was listed, and he was born in 1810 and died in 1820. Behind the stone was a huge tree, and it was right next to a pathway. I could not believe that the Ouija board actually worked. After discovering Charlie's grave, my best friend and I would sit and visit him every day after school. We would go hang out there when we were bored. Sometimes we would just sit next to him, smoke cigarettes, and talk. Maybe Charlie was just one lonely kid and wanted some friends. So that's what we gave him. So I don't know how many people really believe in ghosts, or the paranormal, or in people who say that they can see them. I would never say that I'm some professional psychic or medium. I'm not. I just know that I've always been able to see things that other people couldn't, hear things other people couldn't, and knew things that other people didn't. Pretty much my whole life. I felt like a freak and a weirdo for a long time until I just realized this is happening and it isn't going away, so I needed to accept it. I got help from professional mediums and the woo-woo community and it helped. Backstory, but important. I was laying in bed in my room a couple years ago, trying to fall asleep. It was a long hallway and my sister's room was at the end and so was my mom's. 
My sister had a friend over who was dealing with an abusive boyfriend, and they were drinking and talking about it. This will also be important. You know how you get that feeling that someone's watching you? Or that feeling in a store when you just know that someone has stepped into your space? You don't have to look. You just know. That's what I felt. I looked up, and there's some girl with just her head poked into my room sideways. I just saw her head sideways leaning past my door frame. She looked shorter, maybe twenties, with long black hair, kind of like the girl from The Ring. I'm looking at her wondering what she wanted, and she started to smile. Slowly, her eyes got huge and black, and her jaw unhinged into this giant, sick, pitch black grin. Ice cold slammed into the pit of my stomach as I just stared at her for what felt like hours frozen in fear before what I'd been taught kicked in and I made her leave. She instantly turned back to normal and skipped off down my hallway toward my sister's room. I thought, oh, is it my sister's friend? Depression and abuse and all those bad situations can really attract those types of beings, so I didn't think anything of it. Fast forward to literally last night. It's been years. My parents got divorced, which is a whole other post of creepy shit. I realized it wasn't just my dad who was the narcissist. It's absolutely my mom, too. They were a toxic pair. And currently, I'm in a situation where I have to live with my mom. It's fine. It's free. I'll be grateful and deal with it. Last night, I'm laying in my bed watching TV, minding my own business. Suddenly, I feel that feeling again. It's always the same feeling, regardless of what type of ghosty it is. For me, anyways. I look at my door, and it's the exact same girl. I asked her what she was doing here, and she didn't respond. She just started smiling. Only this time, her eyes went white, and her mouth grew into the same huge black grin, but she had tons of teeth like a shark. I get up to get my incense, which drives them out, and she runs in the direction of my mom's room. I go out into the hallway to look in that direction, and I see through my mom's cracked door this weird demon girl literally sitting crouched on top of my mom, staring at me. Almost like she was an animal claiming her prey. It was wild. I've never ever seen anything like that before. I also realized that this girl was never with my sister's friend. She was with my mom for however many years. But my mom's a crazy and very, very negative person regardless of what anyone does to help her. She loves drama and loves being a victim and loves complaining, so it's matching her energy, I guess. This ghost girl feels more like a bully than anything truly demonic. Like she had fun picking on people, which my mom absolutely does too. This ghost girl can't hurt me. She's just around, and man, it sure is scary when she is. She looks like an absolute demon, that's for sure. I've since seen other types of entities in her room at night while she slept, and have told her about it. She says I'm crazy at first, and then in the days that follow, she'll tell me how it feels dark. I've had several unexplained encounters, which I guess you could say are paranormal. I've never believed in that kind of stuff until the experience that I'm going to tell you now. There's a creek below my house where me and my friend would go to hang out when we were kids. It was away from everyone, where we could do whatever we wanted to. We'd normally build a fire and just chill and bring a radio so that we could listen to music. One day, I decided that we should go fishing, since we never have down there, and there's a bunch of deep spots that are perfect for it. So I get my grandpa's old fishing rod. It was literally a piece of bamboo with a fishing line tied to it. 
I don't know why, but I just wanted to test it out. He brought his dad's old fishing pole. Both my grandpa and his dad had unfortunately passed away years ago. We pack everything up and head down. We decide first to start fishing near the entrance to the creek because there's a few deep spots there. So we bait our hooks and I throw my line in and he does second. As we're waiting for a bite, my friend tells me someone is coming. I turn around and see no one, yet he says he can hear walking. I keep looking and soon I see a man coming around the corner wearing a hat and overalls. He's very dirty as well, like he just got done working on a car or something. When he sees us, he stops and stares. My friend starts freaking out and telling me to get my knife, since I always carry one. I, however, feel like he wasn't a threat, and just watched him. My friend has always been nervous around strangers and has a fear of them. He begins walking toward us without a word and stops only a few feet away from my friend. He doesn't seem to acknowledge me and doesn't even look at me and my friend. He stares at him without uttering a word. My friend finally speaks up and says, Can I help you? The man simply replies, Have you seen my wife and kids? He also calls my friend by name. My friend replies, No, I haven't seen anyone else down here. The man says nothing and walks away, and as he walks around the corner, I follow him, and as I look around the corner, he vanishes. I see no trace of him, and there's no place he could have gone except straight, because there's fences on both sides. I look back at my friend and tell him he's gone. My friend tells me that's not possible unless he could run extremely fast uphill. I then asked if he knew him because he called him by name, but he swears he has no idea who the man was and has never seen him before. We both decided that was enough for one day, packed everything up, and left. We never saw him again, though we've been down there hundreds of times since that incident. Not long ago, however, I stumbled upon a gravestone hidden in thick grass at the same creek. It was a man who died in the 1970s, who was also a Vietnam veteran. I had just moved into a new place and I was living alone. I bought a Ouija board and played with it my first night there by myself. Nothing really happened, so I stashed it in my dresser under some old jeans and forgot about it. A few weeks later, I was having a party and suggested that we all play with it. Everyone agreed. I went to get it, but it wasn't there. I was dumbfounded. I'm pretty tidy. I know where I put it, but I could not find it. I couldn't explain it, so I just said that I had misplaced it. I had basically forgotten about it by the next morning. Fast forward six months. As I'm going to bed, I lie on my stomach. I slide my arms under my pillow to get comfy. My hand hits something. It's the planchette. I have no idea how it ended up there. I threw it out and I have never seen it again, but I fear that whatever happened with the board and the fact that I was an edgy teen opened something up. I was into all that black magic crap. I've done lots of rituals with seemingly no results. There's a lot more to this story. Basically, my roommates and I were terrorized in two separate houses by something that we cannot explain. Like it was following us. All I know is that it looked like a little girl, but I don't think that it was. I never believed in this kind of stuff, but it's hard to deny what we all experienced. It all started when I was five or six years old and had an imaginary friend called Bombo. He was a small Victorian boy who lived with his mother, who I said lived under the floorboards, in the house that I grew up in. 
I used to talk and play with him all the time, teaching him about things like my Velcro shoes and some of the toys that I had. It was no secret to my family who Bombo was, and even what he looked like, or at least from how I had described him. One day, my sister, who was 14 years old at the time, went back upstairs to our shared room after a family day out and saw him standing in the corner of the room staring at her. He was exactly how I had described him, even down to the detail of his clothes. A few years passed, and I was now 10 or 11 years old. Our family had moved house a couple of times, and now lived in a three-story house in a village just outside my hometown. I always had a weird feeling about that house from the moment we moved in, but didn't think much of it over the excitement of having my own room on the top floor that had a skylight. After a few months, things started to get strange. My things would disappear, I would hear footsteps on the middle floor landing at night, etc. These experiences progressively ended up getting stranger, with sounds like nails being dragged up the railings on the top floor getting worse and worse, as well as some nights, my little sister, who was three at the time, screaming, saying that there was a man growling at her in her room. Although, my family put that down to an overactive imagination and didn't really think anything else of it. It was quiet for a couple of months, before everything came back again. This time, it was much worse. This was the first time I saw it. One night I was in my room watching TV and getting things ready for school the next day. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a face peering in at me through my skylight. Its skin was dark and its eyes were white with no pupils, only veins, dark circles around its eyes leading to black cracks across its face. It was grinning at me, and even without pupils, I knew that it had its eyes locked on me. Needless to say that after a few seconds of initial shock, I ran downstairs to the rest of my family and refused to go back into my room. Shortly after this, my older sister, who had given birth recently and was living with us temporarily, had her own experience. As she was sleeping one night, she heard a knock on her door between 2 and 3 a.m., Thinking I was the one knocking, she shouted, what? Twice, with no response. The door flung open after a few seconds with such force that the dresser had dented the door from the impact. No one was there. Shortly afterwards, we moved again for personal reasons to the house that we have now been in for years. For years, there was no unusual experiences other than the occasional sound of footsteps. Nothing that could be logically explained. When I was 18, my sleep schedule was the same as any teenager, waking up around noon and going to bed around 3 to 4 a.m. This one night in particular, I was up doing the same as always, listening to music, watching films, etc. At midnight, I went downstairs to the kitchen as usual to get some snacks. On my way back out of the kitchen, I saw it again. It was standing behind the front door, looking in through one of the glass panels. It was the same face that I saw all those years ago. Same skin. Same eyes. Same dark circles and cracking features. It was staring right at me, this time with one of its hands leaning on the other glass panel as it watched me. The only difference was that this time it wasn't grinning. After standing there for what felt like an eternity, I ran as fast as I could up to my room and locked myself inside. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Some family friends who were regular churchgoers theorized after they heard what I saw that this thing that I saw was Bombo, or what had taken the form of him in the first place, and that when I had stopped giving him my attention and energy, he had then tried to use another way of getting my attention. I don't know what to think for sure. All I know is that what I saw was the exact same thing that I saw as a child, and it came back. It's been four years since the last time I saw it, and I hope I never see it again.
Back in the winter of 2019, my partner and I had settled into a hotel for a few days before going on vacation elsewhere. I am somewhat sensitive. I've never seen a full body apparition in reality and never had any physical paranormal happenings up until this point either. I've only ever felt feelings in environments. This hotel room was no different. Upon entering the room, I felt a sense of calm when stepping inside. However, there was also a sense of curiosity. I felt as if something was watching my partner and I. Over time, this feeling became more comfortable, to put it lightly. Over the course of the next few days, different feelings became more noticeable by the minute. Most of the feelings consisted of being watched. Eventually, I asked my partner on our second day there, Hey, do you feel anything off about this room? To this they responded, no. Whatever was watching us noticed that I noticed them. That's when the experience turned from lingering to dark. Later that night in bed, I had a normal dream. I don't remember most of it other than maybe one image of running curiously through a black hall of mirrors. Suddenly, as if I had blinked, I saw the hotel bed, my partner and I, sleeping. We were laying away from each other, but there was a mass between us. A dark mass. It leaned in closer to me and I felt what can only be described as a light body pressure on my back and arm as it held around my torso. The thing spoke to me in my sleep, more specifically in my mind. It had a male voice but took on the voice of a mixture of my partner and my first ex-partner. It casually threatened that it was going to hurt my partner. I couldn't move and my perspective was going back and forth from my own perspective of laying on one side of the bed to seeing a bird's eye view of the bed. I wasn't lucid enough to tell it to go away, but did have enough control to ask why and to say, don't hurt us. It then responded, I don't want to hurt you, but I want to hurt your partner and I'm going to. I kept telling it not to, to better not to, to leave us alone. Then it threatened to hurt me as well. I could feel its intent, so I stopped responding. To my silence it replied, good. Be glad that I'm not hurting you, but your partner is going to hurt. Right about now. As soon as it said now, I jolted awake to the sound of my partner's blood-curdling scream. My partner's leg had developed a charley horse cramp in their sleep at the same time that the spirit had spoken its statement. I could still feel the spirit's energy upon wakening, and one thought popped into my head. I told you. The next morning, we packed our bags for the vacation. I could feel whatever had tormented my partner the other night watching us leave. I told my partner about the incident, and they jokingly told me not to sick any demons on them. But they did believe me. I've never had a spirit contact me so directly in my life before this. That spirit did not attach to me, surprisingly. It stayed in the hotel room, and it's unlikely that I'll ever go back there again. At first, I thought she was on drugs, but then she did something that made me wonder if she was telling the truth. I was 16. A friend and I were walking through a local park at night when we saw this Asian woman wearing what looked like a traditional Chinese dress. She was dancing alone in the grass, and she then started running toward us, scared the crap out of me, and began telling us how handsome that we were. This woman appeared to be in her mid to late twenties, and honestly, she was stunningly beautiful. She kept telling us that she was a vampire, and that she was centuries old. I was thinking, okay, she's obviously on something, or she's crazy. But then she gazes into my eyes and says, Do you want to feel my energy? I said, sure. And she then placed her hand a few inches from my face. The amount of energy or whatever it was that came from her hand caused my entire skull to vibrate and made me extremely dizzy. I have no idea 
what that could have been. I have never seen her again to this day, but I often think about it. I'm 23 now. I tried researching Asian myths and legends, trying to discover some kind of spirit or demon common to a specific culture that resembles her. Could anyone tell me what this apparition was, or if she was just a crazy woman with psychic abilities? In 2017, my girlfriend and I moved into a tiny, kinda crappy house in our college town. The house was made by a couple of students a few years prior, so the architecture was a bit sloppy. For example, the roof was flat. Take note of this, because it'll be important later. However, the house was really cheap and close to campus, so it seemed like a total steal. The first couple months living there, nothing out of the ordinary happened, but it wasn't too long before we began experiencing strange paranormal activities. The first odd occurrence was with our smoke detectors. Our smoke detectors would go off constantly. It was strange because they would go off even if there wasn't smoke in the house from our bad cooking, for example. We thought that maybe it was because of old batteries, but no matter how many times we changed them, it never made a difference. It got to the point where they were going off three to five times a day, and at that, we just broke down and took the batteries out of them all together. Note, there were six detectors in total. However, even without the batteries, the detectors were still going off. So out of desperation, we turned off the entire smoke detector circuit to the house. It was at this point when things started getting really out of control. The back room slash storage room in the house always had a really eerie feeling, like someone was watching you or standing just behind you staring down at you. Thankfully, me and my girlfriend's bedroom was the furthest room in the house away from the storage area, so I avoided it like the plague. Anyways, one night around 3 a.m., the smoke detector in our bedroom goes off. However, it's not the usual repetitive beeping, it's a single, long beep. It sounded like when someone holds the test button on a detector. Frustrated, my girlfriend grabs a chair from the dining room and stands on it to reach the detector, but moments before she touches it, the beeping stops. We both groan in irritation as she goes to put the chair back, but before she makes it to the dining room, the detector down the hallway from our room makes the same continuous beep. Just like before, she stands on the chair to reach the detector, but right before grabbing it, it stops. Our smoke detectors continued this pattern all the way back to the creepy storage room. This happened two more times that night. It was as if whatever was messing with us was trying to lead us to its space. This would happen to us at least once or twice a week for the next year and a half that we lived there. Shortly after the encounters with the smoke detectors, the house became absolutely infested with bugs. There was no history of bug issues when we bought the home, and it started almost immediately after our first experience with the detectors. Bugs would pour out of light fixtures, small cracks in the walls, counters, and of course, the smoke detectors. Literally one minute everything would be fine, and then the next, winged insects or ants would pour out of the walls. We had multiple exterminators come, but less than a week after treating the house, the bugs would be back, just as bad as before. It made us miserable, and I've never seen an infestation to that extreme. It was absolutely unnatural. After these events, we began feeling really terrified and depressed. We both hated being home, but there was no other place for us to go. This was when the footsteps started. Remember how I said our roof was flat? At least a few times a week, we would hear large, heavy, possibly hoof-like footsteps on the roof. We tried writing it off as being animals, so whenever we heard the steps, we would run outside to see if we could spot whatever the animal was. But there was never anything there. The steps were very far apart from one another. 
whatever was walking on our roof, would start from the creepy storage room and in maybe three or four steps, walk to our bedroom. The steps were so loud that it sounded like whatever was haunting us was either very big or stomping to get our attention. Now began the phantom sounds. We had large metal bowls that we used for daily cooking, so when we were done, we would wash them and set them on the counter to dry. The first time it happened, me and my girlfriend were sitting on the couch in the living room. The kitchen was right next to the living room, but there was an island that blocked our view to the sink area. Anyways, on this night, we were startled by the sound of our multiple metal bowls being thrown off of the counter. At this time, we didn't have pets, so we assumed the worst and thought that someone might be breaking into the house. We both shot up and ran over to face our worst fear, but not only was no one in the house, nothing in the kitchen had been moved. The bowls were still on the counter, just where we left them. This was the most common paranormal occurrence in the house, and it happened at least five to ten times a day at all hours. After a while, we were so sick and tired of these disturbances that we stopped using our metal bowls, or if we did use them, we would hand dry them and put them away right after use. This didn't make the spirit very happy, so next, we started hearing what sounded like our ceramic plates being thrown to the ground, and our kitchen cabinets slamming over and over again. Do you know those types of cabinet hinges that close slowly? Yeah, that's what we had. So, to slam the cabinets like that, they would have had to have been closed with excessive force. The next phase in our haunting was sightings and photographs. The phone I had at the time had one of those automatic face tracking features, meaning that when you would take pics on my phone, the yellow boxes would appear around the person's face to focus on them. One night I was taking a picture in me and my girlfriend's bedroom when a yellow face tracker square appeared at the foot of our bed, way above our bed. If that was a person, they would have had to have been at least seven feet tall. At the time, we did have posters on our bedroom walls, so while focusing on the face tracker square, I circled the room to confirm that the tracker wasn't just focusing on one of them by accident. To my dismay, no matter where I was in the room, or from what angle, the square stayed in the exact same place. Oh yeah, even better, I was home alone for a few nights. I don't think I've ever experienced such sheer terror as I did when I went to sleep that night. After this first encounter, having cameras track faces in our pictures became a constant occurrence all throughout the house. The final phase of our haunting before getting the heck out of there was physical encounters. This happened more often to my girlfriend than me, but something would occasionally grab and pull our hair, especially when we were walking through the living room. But the most terrifying experience goes to our friend Jamie. She came to visit us for a few nights, and while she was there, she would sleep on our couch. She was aware of all the paranormal encounters in the house, and she had seen most of them firsthand, but nothing compared to what was about to happen. It was around three in the morning when she woke up with an eerie, uncomfortable feeling. All of a sudden, she experienced what felt like someone or something stepping up onto the couch. It stepped both of its feet up, one on either side of her body. Starting from her feet, it slowly walked up the length of her body until it felt like two feet were on either side of her head. She said she felt an intense, malevolent energy staring down at her, but she was too terrified to open her eyes. Meanwhile, the cabinets in the kitchen began to slam over and over. For the next few hours, she pretended to be asleep all the while this presence was standing over her. She told me she's not exactly sure when it went away, because she eventually became so exhausted that she did fall back asleep. Not too long after this experience, we were finally able to sell the house and get the heck out. We lost tons of money because we sold it for way less than we had originally paid. I can't help but feel bad for the person who bought the home, but it's been almost three years and she's still living there. 
I think the takeaway from this story is if a house is priced too good to be true, then it is. Earlier today, I think I might have seen something, but I don't know. This happened a few hours ago while I was outside mowing my lawn. Quickly out of my yard. When you walk down my driveway toward the street, if you look to the left, you'll see a dead end. And if you look to the right, you'll see a big tree that you couldn't see through. This is relevant. Now, on to what happened. I was mowing the lawn inside my fence, and when I finished that, I went over to the part of my yard that was outside of my fence. After I finished mowing, I looked to the right and saw a pair of legs on the other side of the tree. All I saw was legs, because I couldn't see the person through the trees. But their legs were all black. Like I couldn't make out any features. I couldn't see any pants or shoes. It was just all pitch black. I'm confused, and so I try walking around the tree to see who it was, but whatever it was ran away. It only took me two seconds to get to the other side, but as I said, whatever it was, was gone. I live on the corner of my block, so there's nowhere that a person could have hidden that fast. I've never believed in the paranormal or had any sort of experience, but I really can't explain what happened. Anyone who's had a similar experience and could possibly give me an explanation, I would appreciate it because I'm still confused.